Simon and Schuster Audio presents World of Warcraft, Wolfheart. Written by Richard A. Knack and read by Scott Brick. Prologue Northrend Twin rows of straining, green-skinned warriors tugged on taut, broad ropes as they dragged the colossal wheeled cage slowly up the wide ramp leading into the last of the ships. Despite Northrend's eternal winter, the muscular orcs sweated heavily from effort. Their broad-jawed faces contorted with each new heave of the ropes. The second war, the Guards stood alongside the ramp, in torches in one hand, ready weapons in the other. The with steely brown eyes, they watched the not the land, workers, but rather the great the covered cage. Their hearts, the cube-shaped the structure towered over them, its outer covering consisting of a great tarp sewn from goatskin. There were no gaps in the tarp, no hint from the container as to just what the cargo was. But there was a clue, revealed simply in the fact that the orcs themselves maneuvered the cargo. Desolate as the port was, it did have work animals, such as the horned reptilian Kodo beasts, strong creatures more than capable of taking the places of the struggling orcs. There was even a trio of mammoths, generally used for transporting several riders at once. Yet not only were those animals excluded from the effort, but they had been moved decidedly far from the vicinity of the docks. Even there they stirred anxiously, the Kodo beasts flaring their nostrils and the mammoths waving their trunks as all the animals stared in the direction of the ships. With a tremendous howl, the winds abruptly picked up to storm strength. Weather in Northrend had only one consistent factor, that it was foul. But there were many levels of foul, and the docks shook as the waters of the cold sea suddenly churned with great waves. Ship hulls groaned as every vessel rocked hard. From deep within some of the ships there came horrendous roars and banging. On deck, crew members rushed to the hatches leading down to the holds. Stern veteran mariners and warriors looked anxious. The last ship also rocked and the gangplank twisted. It dipped to one side, spilling several startled guards and throwing the workers into a tangle. The cage shifted. At the last moment, the orcs on the teetering ramp kept the container from falling. However, no sooner had they managed that than it began to shake from within. A roar identical to those emanating from the ships, but much deeper, echoed through the dank port. Something within began pulling at the tarp. Guards rushed up from the port. Those still astride the gangplank fought desperately to maintain their balance. One failed, instead tumbling into the chill waters between the dock and the ship. From the shoreline, the fleet captain, a one-eyed veteran mariner called Brilm, whose body bore numerous intricate tattoos marking his journeys, raced toward the side of the gangplank and shouted, Get that cage straightened! Don't let it fall! Get those weapons ready! Where's the powder? If that cage is damaged... The cage beneath the tangled tarp rattled. The dim illumination of the wind-blown torches was insufficient to reveal what was happening, but the nerve-scraping wrenching of metal gave Brilm enough warning. Spears up front! Hurry, you awful! The right side of the cage! Two guards, either more impetuous or more foolish than the rest, moved in closer. From his angle, Brilm could not make out everything that happened next. But he saw enough. The foremost orc prodded the cage with his spear. The next instant, something snagged his weapon and tugged both it and him through a tear in the tarp. As that happened, the second orc instinctively lunged forward to aid his vanishing comrade. Something thick darted through the tear. The orc was too slow to realize his danger. He was plucked from the gangplank as if weighing nothing. 
Before his fellows could reach him, the massive appendage crushed the guard's torso. Flesh, bone, plate armor, and all. The gore splattered those farther back. The hand threw the limp, ruined body aside, then retreated into the covered cage. From within there immediately came a cry from the first warrior, apparently left alive for the moment. Orcs with long, thick spears quickly lunged toward the spot as Brilne raced up to join them. Two guards thrust, but the captain knew that it was already too late. Shrieks that almost stopped him in his tracks echoed through the North Rend port. The utter fear in those cries could be felt as well as heard. There was little that could shake an orc's resolve, or even draw up in one anything resembling terror. But what had been captured at already so much cost was more than capable. A horrific, crushing sound punctuated the shrieks. The orcs near the opening stepped back as something liquid sprayed them. A ghastly stench immediately followed, filling their noses. Spears! Spears! Brown roared again as he neared. The captain looked up. The torchlight enabled him to see the rip in the tarp and the bent bars. Those bars had been forged strong. Even with all his might, the gargantuan beast had been unable to do more than pull the bars just a little farther apart. Unfortunately for the two guards, that had been quite sufficient. Where's the powder? Brilne demanded to no one in particular. Another orc finally rushed up with a burlap sack the size of a thick fist. He also wore a coarse cloth over his mouth and nose and handed one just like it to Brilm, who used the two strings attached to the piece to secure it to his own face. The mask was merely a precaution. Nothing from the sack should have ended up in either Brilm's nose or mouth, but there was no sense in taking unnecessary chances. The captain was tempted to let the other orc do the task, but then he seized the sack himself. From within the nearby cage, sickening ripping sounds continued. Cover me! The captain positioned himself, then studied the gap carefully. Although he had lost the one eye years ago in battling Kalimdor against the Alliance forces commanded by the human Admiral Proudmoor, Brilm still prided himself on his expert aim. Taking a deep breath behind the cloth mask, the scarred orc tossed the pouch toward the gap. The wind gusted, and for a moment Brilm was filled with fear that the sack would miss entirely. However, it just barely made the edge of the rip, then fell into the obscured cage. A moment later the captain heard a small, soft thump. The beast within let out a distrusting rumble. There was the sound of chewing. A slight mist of powder exited the tear, but not enough to concern the orcs. The wind carried away what little escaped, dispersing it. Inside the covered cage, something heavy and moist dropped. Brill knew it to very likely be what was left of the guard. Despite that, the sound gave the captain more hope that his plan had succeeded. A confused grunt arose from the shrouded creature. Suddenly the cage shook harder. Inside a huge form slammed against the bent bars. Heavy breathing arose near the tear in the tarp, but nothing could be made out clearly in the tear itself. The breathing became labored, exhausted. The orcs heard stumbling. Then there came a violent thud. The cage shuddered and almost slipped again. Only the strength of nearly two dozen struggling orcs kept that from happening. Brown and the others waited several tense moments, but there was no renewed movement or sound. With caution, the captain approached the covered cage. Becoming more daring, he prodded the tarp. Nothing happened. Brown exhaled in relief, then turned to the others. Load that thing aboard, then get those bars bent back and that hole covered with something. Better make sure that there's always a sack of that herb concoction the shaman gave us ready to sprinkle on the thing's food. We can't afford this on the seas. The other orcs moved to follow his orders. The captain studied the silhouettes of the other ships. 
each contained such a cage. The new war chief Garrosh had commanded that this venture be completed, regardless of the cost in seeing it done. Brilne and the others here had not questioned that cost either, for all would have readily perished for the legendary overlord of the Warsong Offensive. Garrosh's deeds were epic and retold over and over in the Horde. He was also the son of the late Gron Hillscream and had been an advisor to Thrall, the orc leader who had freed their people from captivity. Yes, no matter how many lives it had already cost and would likely cost by the time the fleet reached its destination, it was all worth it to Brilm and the others. The Horde was at last within grasp of its destiny. It had the vitality, the drive, that this altered Azeroth deserved. Those who had held power so long in the world had become decadent, too weak and soft. The Horde, and especially the Orcs, would finally stake a claim on the more lush regions that it needed not only to survive, but finally to thrive as it had long deserved. This recent cataclysm, so Garrosh had impressed upon his people, was the great sign that this was their day. The world had been torn asunder, and to survive meant to be able to adapt to its much transformed lands. The crew members finally had the last cage loaded. Brilne watched as they sealed the hull. They had a fair supply of the sleep powder in stock, and there were other threats that were supposed to keep the creatures in line. But the Elder Orc looked forward to the end of the journey. Aboard deck, his first mate saluted. Everything secured, Captain. All set to sail on your word. Get us going, then, Brilm growled. The sooner we get this cargo to Garrosh, the sooner it becomes the Alliance's trouble. The other orc grunted agreement, then turned to bellow Brilne's command. In short order, the ship pulled away from the dock. The winds whirled madly, and thunder crashed. A storm was brewing, the last thing the fleet needed. Still, the captain thought it nothing compared to what the Horde's enemies would soon face. Brilne stared beyond the dark, swirling waters, imagining the fleet's destination imagining what his cargo would do once Garrosh had it under his reins. And for a moment, Brilne almost pitied Ashenvale's defenders, almost pitied the Night Elves. But then, they were only Night Elves. Chapter 1 The Wolf Tyrande Whisperwind knew that the world could never be mended. Deathwing, the great black dragon, had forever changed the face of all Azeroth in a manner even more terrifying in some ways than the Sundering, when the world's lone continent was savagely split apart. The High Priestess, who had survived that epic event some 10,000 years ago, had never imagined that she would have to live through anything so brutal again. To those few who might have been unfamiliar with her race, the Night Elf, her midnight blue hair falling below her shoulders, seemed barely more than two decades old, rather than 10,000 years. However, her glittering silver eyes were filled with the wisdom of so much experience. There were some very fine lines near those elegant eyes, but they were more the result of troubled times during the past ten millennia than from age. Tyrande strode through the lush temple gardens, the centerpiece, though geographically more west of the center, of Darnassus, and composed of several islets of varying size, filled with the most exquisite flora. The light of a full moon shone down upon the gardens, and with what appeared particular favor upon her. That it did so disturbed neither Tyrande nor any who happened by the High Priestess. After all, it was a normal sight, already familiar to those who knew the solemn figure. 
She had hoped that out here she would be better able to think, to come to some conclusion concerning the weighty matters upon her. As High Priestess, Tyranda generally sought guidance and peace from the goddess Elune, also called the Mother Moon, from a place of quiet meditation in the temple directly to the south. However, even the calm of the perpetually moonlit sanctum of the Sisterhood, the heart of Elun herself, some called it, had no longer proven enough. Thus, she had hoped the tranquil gardens might suffice where the temple had failed. But although the gardens in some ways embodied the spirit of the Mother Moon even more than the temple, it was not enough to calm the High Priestess this night. Tyrande could not keep from constantly worrying about the upcoming summit. The time of the gathering was fast approaching, and already she and the arch-druid Malfurion Stormrage, her co-ruler and mate, wondered whether the event would prove worth anything at all. The Alliance faced a revitalized horde, now led not by the seemingly conflicted Thrall, who might have kept the peace for the sake of both sides, but rather by a new, much more ambitious war chief. Garrosh coveted the great forests of Ashenvale, though he would hardly stop with them should they fall to his warriors. Despite as an archdruid being more concerned with the wilds of Azeroth and having absolutely no ambitions toward politics, Malfurion had done what he could to help maintain unity in the Alliance. However, Tyrande and Malfurion both knew that the Alliance's future did not and could not rely upon him. It was time for someone who could be more dedicated to that goal. That was thus one of the points of this summit Tyrande and Malfurion had put together to see if through the talks someone would arise who could best guide those assembled forward in this new world. Of course, the gathering would not matter if not all the members were in attendance, and there were some of significance who still had not sent word of their participation. If they did not join, then no true accord would likely be acceptable. Among those Tyranda passed during her trek were other priestesses, all of whom bowed low in homage to her. They were clad in silver-white sleeveless robes similar to her own. Tyrande wore little ornamentation, needing none to mark her as High Priestess. All knew her. She acknowledged their greeting with a smile and a nod of her head, but so engrossed was she in her dark thoughts that, in truth, she forgot the encounters immediately after. The foul vision of Deathwing the Destroyer and what he had caused filled her mind, nearly overwhelming her. Her heart pounded and her blood raced as she imagined the continuing repercussions of his terrifying act. The summit must prove of benefit, Tyrande thought anxiously. This is the one opportunity we have to stave off the downfall of our world. If nothing comes of this, there will be no hope of attempting another gathering. It will be too late for all of us by then but they had not received word from three of the major members of the Alliance, including Stormwind. And if Stormwind alone did not participate, then... Around her, the light of Elune grew blinding. The Temple Gardens vanished. Tyrande Whisperwind stumbled, then caught herself. Her eyes widened. New surroundings came into view, surroundings not at all even a part of Darnassus, the Night Elf capital. She now stood in a place far away, a place clearly on the mainland, on the continent of Kalimdor. Tyrande had been transported hundreds of miles in less than a single heartbeat. More shocking than that, she was surrounded by the unmistakable vision of war. The stench of wholesale death was familiar to her, and darkened mounds roughly the size and shape of bodies. Mangled ones were everywhere. What had once been pristine wilderness, a few ruined tree trunks marked that this had once been forest, had clearly been ravaged by previous battles here. As the High Priestess fought to regain her composure, it quickly dawned on her that she knew this place, this time, though whether from memory or because of Elune, it was impossible to say. 
She stood in the midst of Azeroth's first climactic struggle against the Burning Legion, a battle fought more than 10,000 years ago during the War of the Ancients. That war had culminated with the Sundering and the sinking of the Night Elf capital of Zinashari into the waters once housing her people's fount of power, the Well of Eternity. The Legion had sought the end of all life on Azeroth and had come horribly close in achieving that monstrous goal, ironically with the help of the Night Elves' own queen. The demonic warriors surged forward, the fiery infernals at the vanguard. The massive constructs were followed by fell guard and fell hounds, the former towering armored warriors and the latter fearsome toothy beasts. Other demons added to their monumental numbers. The insidious army rushed over the landscape unhindered, contrary to what the night elf recalled of that history. Anything touched by the demons burst into the same horrific green flame that surrounded each of the monstrosities. Tyrande looked for those defenders she knew should be here, her own people and the many fantastic allies who had gathered to prevent the destruction of Azeroth. However, they were nowhere to be seen. Nothing blocked the destructive forces. The land, the world was doomed. But then a powerful howl shook the scene. The High Priestess felt her hopes instinctively rise. She felt she should know that howl, for it touched her very soul. The demons faltered, though only for a moment. As one, they let out a mighty roar themselves, then renewed their push forward. From the opposite direction, a great shadow stretched across the landscape. Tyrande followed it to its origin. The wolf, ancient, was gigantic, majestic, and so pure white that he all but gleamed. He towered over all else. The huge animal howled again, and this time countless other howls joined in from somewhere behind him. Goldrin, Tyrande murmured. From the dawn of its reshaping by the mysterious titans, Azeroth had been guarded by beings who were tied to the world as no other creatures could be. The dragons had been empowered by the titans, but Azeroth itself gave rise to spirits and demigods, creatures eternal in nature yet capable of ultimate sacrifice. But not until the War of the Ancients had any of these protectors faced a threat as terrifying as the Burning Legion. Dragons had perished by the scores, and among the spirits and demigods there were many who fell in the final battle. One of those had been Goldrin. Yet, this bloody scene before her was not exactly history. Tyrande finally understood that, though her natural instinct was to fear not only for her world, but also for the wolf seeking to protect it again. Elune had chosen this urgent scene to tell her something, though the High Priestess was at a loss as to what it might be. Was she to watch Goldrin sacrifice himself once more? Several demons neared the giant wolf, who growled his challenge to them. But as the attackers came upon him with renewed cries, a vast pack of mortal wolves leapt from the emptiness behind Goldrin. They poured over the landscape, sleek furred hunters already sizing up their individual prey. Though they were not as huge as most of the demons, they charged with ferocity and determination unparalleled. The two forces collided. The demons wielded blades, axes, savage teeth, claws, and more, and knew how to use all of them well. At first it seemed the wolves had only teeth and claws, but their dexterity and swiftness were unmatched. They darted among their sinister foes, snapping and slashing wherever there was an opening. Goldrin stood at the forefront. The huge wolf seized a fell guard in his mouth and bit through. Green flames erupted as the beast let the fragments fall. At the same time, his claws crushed through another foe. Two wolves brought down an axe-wielding enemy who had just cleaved in twain one of their brethren. The wolves tore the demon's arms off, then one took out the throat. 
However, other demons fell upon them, overwhelming the pair. Tyrande strained to join the battle, but could not move. She could only watch helplessly as more wolves perished, and even though they seemed to take more than their number in adversaries, that did little to assuage her fears and regrets for them. More and more demons focused on Goldrin, clearly aware that he was what guided the wolves. The demons tried to hack away at his limbs or drag him down so that they could cut his throat, but Goldrin shook off those near his paws, batting some away so hard that they crashed into their own comrades. In his savage jaws, the gigantic wolf plucked up one demon after another. Some he bit to pieces like the first, others he shook until the sheer force sent their body parts scattering. Goldrin barreled through the Burning Legion's ranks, his eager pack ever at his side. Bloody wolf carcasses and dismembered demon corpses already littered the battlefield, but the two sides' numbers appeared undiminished. Another wolf was chopped to pieces, and even more demons attacked Goldrin. Yet the enormous wolf was undaunted and continued to claw and bite one foe after another, leaving them piled three and four high in many places. Mother Moon, why do you show this to me? The High Priestess strained to leap to Goldrin's aid, but still could not do more than observe. Either let me join this struggle, or tell me the purpose of this endless slaughter, please! But the fight went on without revelation, and worse matters suddenly took a dark turn for Goldrin. Harassed from all sides, the wolf could not fend off all his opponents. Demons struck him again and again, the growing number of wounds finally beginning to take their toll on the great ancient. One of the Felguard managed to climb atop the white wolf's back. The fiendish warrior, his eyes blazing green in anticipation, raised his weapon and struck hard at the center of the wolf's spine. No! Tyrande cried out, realizing what was about to happen. She was well aware of this dire event, though she had never known the details. Goldrin let out an anguished howl. His legs collapsed beneath him. Demons pushed at him in greater numbers. From somewhere in the madness to the ancient's right, a single dark brown wolf leapt up. Though the height should have been beyond his capabilities, the smaller wolf managed to reach not only Goldrin's back, but the demon who had so terribly wounded him as well. The Felguard turned just as the wolf neared. The demon attempted to slash at the newcomer, but the sleek, lupine form darted under the axe blade. The wolf then bore into the Felguard's legs, toppling his towering foe. Crashing against Goldrin's back, the demon lost his weapon. The Felguard sought to rise, but the wolf was already upon him. With one ferocious bite, the wolf tore out the demon's throat. As the corpse slipped off the side, the lesser wolf howled. He glanced down, then jumped. His leap was not without purpose, for he landed atop another demon harassing Goldrin, then tore out the chest of that one. Taking the lesser wolf's lead, others of the pack began rending those demons intent on Goldrin's destruction. The Burning Legion was at last forced to abandon the taking of the wolf ancient and, indeed, was now pressed back. But it was too late for Goldrin. The ancient managed to push himself up and seize in his mouth a demon. He bit through the armor and sinew, spitting out the pieces. But then the wound took its toll. The ancient collapsed, crushing a few more of his enemies, and then lay unmoving. Again, as had happened more than ten thousand years before, Goldrin died. Yet, seemingly undaunted by this terrible loss, the dark brown wolf spearheaded the advance, pushing ahead of Goldrin's corpse. More and more of the lesser wolves joined their brother, now becoming avengers of their patron. One demonic warrior after another perished at the teeth and claws of the dark brown wolf. 
He howled between adversaries. His cry now as great as that of Goldrin. He seemed larger, too, more than twice the size of the others. The Burning Legion began to steer their efforts against him, but that seemed only to encourage the Brown Wolf. He took on every demon that attacked and left in his wake their tattered bodies. With so many demons much taller than him, the wolf even began jumping up on his hind legs in order to better snap at an arm or even a lowered head. His front claws slashed through armor and flesh as well as any blade. A helpless Tyranda let out another gasp. The more she stared at the valiant wolf, the more comfortable he seemed on two legs as opposed to four. The claws of one hand clamped together so tightly that they were as one, and also grew with each successive cut. This was different from what the High Priestess had heard had happened during the original battle, and she knew immediately that history had now slipped into something else. This was what Elune truly wished to reveal to her, though what it meant was yet a mystery to the Night Elf. The wolf's claws abruptly became a true greatsword, and the brown wolf fully a man, an armored warrior whose face the high priestess could not make out from where she watched. The pack right behind him, he continued to challenge the burning legion, his sword thrust again and again. A startling new change followed, but this time among the demons. They transformed becoming foes equally recognizable and far more imminent. Orcs. The transformation was swift and happened without notice by those involved. The wolves tore at the orcs as if they had always been the enemy. Felling another opponent, the shattered warrior raised his sword and let out a triumphant shout that still had hints of a lupine howl. The wolf pack surged again, but now they also stood on their hind legs and their forepaws became hands wielding axes, maces, and other weapons. Like their leader, they were now human, albeit even more shadowed than he was. Disarray overtook the orcs. Their numbers dwindled. The lead warrior once again confidently shouted. And from behind the line of battle, in the direction the High Priestess knew the body of the Wolf Ancient lay, there came an answering howl. Tyrande turned her gaze there and beheld two goldrins. The first was the corpse of the slain animal. The second was a glorious, translucent spirit who once more howled victory. But though the wolf spirit was like mist, there was something else within him, something more solid and somewhat familiar. With a start, the High Priestess realized that she was staring at the shadowed leader, despite the fact that he should have been at the forefront of the battle. Then, blinking, Tyrande noticed that she was watching the forefront. Both areas had suddenly blended together. Goldrin's ghostly countenance hovered over his champion, who seemed to grow taller yet. An orc wielding two axes swung at the champion. The warrior deflected the first axe, then swiftly did the same with the second. With a whirl of the sword, he then brought the blade between both axes and thrust it deep into the orc's chest. Blood spurted from the gaping wound as the champion pulled the weapon free. The orc gaped staggered. His eyes glazed. The axes fell from his twitching fingers. The hulking orc dropped to his knees. His body shook and blood flowed from his mouth, dribbling over his jaw and tusks. The shadowed hero took a step back. The orc fell forward, landing face first at his slayer's feet. As he perished, so too did the last of his comrades. The battle was over. The spectral Goldrin let out a new howl. Then he and the warrior fully blended together. At the same time, the shadowed champion at last turned his gaze toward Tyrande. His face was finally visible. And at that moment, the High Priestess returned to the Temple Gardens. Tyrande wavered briefly, 
then quickly regained her composure. There was no one else in sight. Perhaps coincidence, perhaps Elune's intention. Tyranda also suspected that not even a second had passed in the mortal world. The High Priestess did not question being suddenly thrust into the vision. Elune had clearly wished to relay something of such urgency to her that it could not wait. Understanding what it was, Tyranda was grateful, yet a bit confused. She realized that someone was approaching her. Smoothing her silver robes, the High Priestess met the gaze of one of General Chandra's Feathermoon's aides. The Sentinel looked a bit flushed, as if she had been running hard. The female Sentinel, her torso, forearms and legs protected by light armor, knelt with the utmost deference before Tyranda, not only because the High Priestess was their leader, but also because the General was Tyranda's adopted daughter. The warrior was armed with one of the favored weapons of the Night Elves, a triple-bladed Moonglaive. Keeping her head down, the other Night Elf said, The General knew that you would wish to see this immediately, High Priestess. The Sentinel held forth a small parchment that bore Chandris's personal seal. Taking the missive and dismissing the aid, Tyranda broke the seal and read the contents. The message was short and to the point, as was the General's way. Word arrives that the King of Stormwind will be joining the summit. There was nothing more save Chandris's mark at the bottom. The news was significant in one great respect, in that if Stormwind was a part of the gathering, then the other holdouts would quickly send word of their coming as well. The High Priestess and Malfurion had been hoping that Stormwind would agree to be part, though of late they had been concerned that its ruler might instead decide the kingdom's fortunes were better without its troubled neighbors. But of even more significance to the High Priestess was the timing of this news. She knew that Chandris had only just received it herself a few minutes before, and that as the General always did, Chandris had made certain that her beloved ruler and mother would share in that knowledge as swiftly as possible. Elune had intended for the vision to coincide with the arrival of the missive. So, Varian is coming, Tyranda murmured. It all makes sense now. I should have seen it. And the vision now became clear. The Night Elf had only had a glimpse of the face, but even then she had been certain that the shadowed champion resembled none other than King Varian Rin of Stormwind. Naturally, the Mother Moon had known, but could only give her High Priestess a sign when there was something that could actually be done with that knowledge. Varian Rin, she repeated, recalling so much about the King's troubled past in that name. He had been a slave, a gladiator, a man with no memory of his true self. He had watched his kingdom fall and fought to take it back from none other than what had turned out to be the daughter of Deathwing in human guise. And during those terrible times, when Varian had lost his name and had been forced to fight for his life nearly every day for the pleasure of spectators, he had been given another name by those in attendance. A uniquely important name. He had been, and still was by many, called Logosh. Logosh. Another name for the ghost wolf, Goldrin. The two cloaked travelers disembarked from the small boat. That they were night elves like the majority of the inhabitants of Rutheron village was evidenced in their build and their ears, which shoved back the fabric of their deep hoods. Their faces remained in shadow. The port village was humble by night elf standards, but exceedingly fresh in appearance, for all the buildings were new. It was actually the second settlement by the name, the first destroyed by the sea during the Cataclysm. The second most significant characteristic of the port other than its three docks was the Hippogriff breeding area, where eggs of the astonishing winged creatures who acted as aerial transport for the night elves were meticulously cared for. The young were raised. 
The most significant aspect of the island was something the pair of travelers had been viewing for quite some time. In fact, they had seen it from miles away on the mainland, just as anyone else in this region would have. Teldrassil was the name given to the island, but only as an afterthought. The island was only an extension of the true Teldrassil, a titanic tree filling most of the land and rising so high the top vanished in the clouds. Its branches were so vast that they dwarfed some kingdoms. The thick crown could have housed an entire civilization. And do you even remember what you did? Indeed, Teldrassil was known as the second world tree. The first ancient Nordrassil still lived, but had yet to recover from the violence of the Third War. Again, against the Burning Legion, only a few years prior. While Nordrassil had provided immortality, good health, protection from the misuses of the Well of Eternity's magic, and an open path to the Emerald Dream, the Second World Tree had and served mainly as the new home for the Night Elf race. Even then, Teldrassil had already had its share of troubles. The tree had been tainted by the evil of the Nightmare Lord through his puppet, the Archdruid Fandral Staghelm. That taint had spread to the flora and fauna upon Teldrassil, and only recently had the tree been cleansed. But as inspiring as the vast tree was to all who saw it, the newcomers almost appeared oblivious to its presence now. The taller of the traveling pair, male, with long silver hair spilling out from his hood, paused to eye with much interest the adult hippogriffs. The slighter and clearly female figure at his side coughed harshly and teetered against her companion. The male quickly turned his attention from the avian creatures and tightened his hold on her. The portal, he murmured. It will be nearby and quicker. Just hold on. We are almost there. Hold on, please. The female's hood briefly bobbed up and down. I will do my best. My husband. Her reply was very weak, and by the stiffening of his form, the male showed his grave concern for his mate. Guiding her forward, he searched for what neither had ever seen, but should have been readily identifiable. A sentinel officer noticed the pair. Her gaze swept over the concealing cloaks. Frowning, her glaive gripped at the ready. She confronted them. Welcome, visitors, she said. May I ask, from where you come? The male looked at her, his face briefly becoming visible. The sentinel's words trailed off, and her face flushed with shock. You! Without a word, the male led his mate past the stunned officer. As he did, that which he sought became visible through the buildings and the crowd. The portal, he murmured. A stone path followed a gentle slope up to Teldrassil. At the base of the tree loomed a tall portal, a huge shimmering mark in Darnassian script emanating from its side. Yet even as high as it stood, the magical entry was dwarfed by some of the great roots arcing down from Teldrassil. The portal was a magical, direct link to the city far, far above. Two sentinels were the only evident guards, but the male traveler knew that there were others hidden near, and, in addition, safety measures built into and around the structure. Undaunted, he led his mate toward the portal. The sentinels eyed him suspiciously. From behind the travelers came the officer's voice. The Let them pass unhindered. The guards did not question the command. The male traveler did not waste time turning to thank the officer. All that mattered was getting his mate to Darnassus, to help. Watch your footing, he whispered to her. She managed a nod. They had succeeded in making it to the portal itself. His hopes rose. Almost there. A fit of coughing overtook her. It became so brutal that he lost his grip on her. She fell to her knees, her hooded face nearly to the stone. He quickly retrieved her, but as he helped her straighten, the soft patter of liquid caught his ear. A small pool of blood decorated the area near where her face had hovered. 
Not again. Her hand, which held his, suddenly squeezed with the incredible strength of the truly fearful. Husband! She collapsed in his arms. The guards moved to assist, but he had no time for them. They might even suggest that he wait while they check on her condition. But in his harried thoughts, any second meant disaster, loss. His only hope was reaching the high priestess. Gripping his slumped mate, the male lunged into the portal. Chapter 2. Incursion. Moving against the slight breeze passing through the forest, the long, thick branches from the nearby trees stretched down. The leafy appendages moved with utmost purpose toward the bearded figure they surrounded. He stared up at the oncoming branches and did nothing but smile. Malfurion's storm rage stood silent as leaves from the first branches caressed his face. Even among those of his calling, he was unique. At first, it appeared that he was adorned with the marks of the great animals whose shapes those most versed in his calling could summon. Only closer inspection revealed that some of these attributes were a part of him, the results of his ties to Azeroth and the many years his spirit had spent in the Emerald Dream. While his dream form had become more and more attuned to that other realm, his sleeping body, still bound to his spirit, had begun to take on elements of these powerful creatures. Thus the edges of his arms grew into the expansive gray wings of the storm crow. The night saber, its bond especially close to those of Malfurion's race, was marked by what were not boots, but the arch druid's fairy feet. They now mimicked the look of the feline's mighty paws. In addition to all this, his kilt bore in front as decoration the curved teeth of the night saber, and his hands were clad in gloves ending in the claws of the bear. One mark that had nothing to do with beasts, and perhaps more with Malfurion in particular, was the blue bolts of lightning that crossed his torso from shoulder to opposing side of the waist. Smaller, complementing bolts darted from his elbow down his forearm. Storm Rage was not merely the Archdruid's surname, it was also a hint of the tremendous power at his command, power that he sought to use only when all other efforts failed. The ends of the branches shifted his long green hair, but artfully avoided that which most made the proud-featured night elf stand out from his brethren. Magnificent antlers, more than a good two feet in length, sprouted from his forehead. They were a sign of his deep ties to Azeroth and his Shondo, his honored teacher, the demigod Cenarius, and also represented the form of the stag. Some of the stronger branches shifted under his arms. Then as gently as a parent lifting an infant, the branches took Malfurion up among the trees. The archdruid opened his mind and touched the heart of Teldrassil. Malfurion studied its health and saw that there was no apparent taint left from the sinister grafting attached by the mad archdruid Fandral Staghelm. Malfurion gave thanks for that. He had been against the creation of the second world tree, but it had become an integral part of night elf existence. Yet that it had become so had been the opposite intention of Fandral, who had first proposed the tree in Malfurion's absence. To the other archdruid, Teldrassil had been only a means to a monstrous end, which thankfully had been averted. Despite the lack of any noticeable taint, Malfurion swore to keep monitoring the tree. There was still a pocket of the nightmare remaining in the Emerald Dream, and as long as any trace of that darkness existed, renewed corruption threatened Teldrassil and thus the night elf race. Still... Satisfied as to the World Tree's present condition, Malfurion took a moment to survey his surroundings. A moon well, one of the sacred founts of water known for their mystical properties, stood not all that far from the Archdruid. 
He had chosen the oracle glade northeast of the city for what his senses indicated was its unique tie to the gargantuan tree in which it was nestled. Here the archdruid felt he could best meditate and, using his spirit or dream form, reach out to the emerald dream. The druids still traveled with their dream forms to the other realm, but did so with some new precautions. Malfurion had not taken long to return to that place, despite having been trapped there for years by the Nightmare Lord. He did not consider himself courageous for having made the choice. The Archdruid hoped to further study the Emerald Dream for any changes he might have missed earlier, and also use this particular journey to clear his mind of certain thoughts. As if to mock his hopes, a sharp twinge suddenly went through him, it was not the first he had felt of late, nor did he think it would be the last. Mortality was beginning to catch up with him. The Archdruid had witnessed the aging of comrades belonging to other races, but to experience it was admittedly not so simple a thing, even if his race was still much longer lived than humans or dwarves. Malfurion fought down a brief moment of petulance, of thinking that he was not supposed to grow old. The twinge had disrupted his thoughts. Trying to restore his calm, Malfurion focused deep into Teldrassil's being. He felt his center calming. Seeking Teldrassil's touch to help him reach the point where he could separate his dream form from his body had proven correct after all. His body now lay nestled in the boughs, protected by the trees that were in their way an extension of the larger one upon which they grew. Malfurion's dream form rose above his still body. Ghostly and emerald in shading, it hovered for a moment. Malfurion! As if thrust by a terrible wind, the archdruid's dream form flew back into his mortal shell. He knew who reached out to him, for she had a unique link to him. Tyrande? The archdruid immediately responded. At an unspoken request by Malfurion, the branches were already lowering him to the ground. Tyrande, what is it? Too much to be said now. Please, come. The urgency in her tone was undeniable. The moment his feet touched the ground, Malfurion hurried on. But after a few steps, he found the pace too slow. Concentrating, the archdruid leaned forward. His bones made crackling sounds as they shifted, and his skin rippled and sprouted fur. The archdruid's face extended, the nose and mouth becoming part of a wide muzzle adorned with long whiskers. Malfurion's teeth grew and his eyes narrowed. His shape transformed, becoming a huge, dark cat akin to one of the saber-toothed felines the night elves used for mounts. Malfurion's pace increased tenfold and more. The sleek cat darted out of the glade. The short distance to Darnassus passed swiftly. Sentinels who saw him approaching wisely stepped aside, aware of who it was rushing to the city in such a form. The archdruid's cat shape was a recognizable thing to the defenders of the city, who had witnessed its power in battle. Much of the city was divided into what were called terraces, where elements of night elf civilization concentrated. The warrior's terrace was already behind him, and that of the craftsman was already to his right. Malfurion scarcely noticed either, just as he paid little mind to the elegant and artistically formed gardens and lake that were the center of Darnassus. His focus was on the shining edifice to the south, the Temple of the Moon. Hey, you a chipper -looking one. But something did suddenly intrude on his concentration, an unsettling gathering of night elves. Malfurion smelled their anxiety, and that stirred his other feline emotions. He bared his great saber-like teeth and dug harder at the ground with his sharp claws as he turned to find out what was the cause. Even before he came to a halt, the archdruid had resumed his true form. The night elves nearest had already scattered from the cat's path, and now they and others who had noticed Malfurion bowed in respect to the august figure. However, Malfurion paid them no mind, 
for he now knew what had so caught the throng's attention and why from them there had radiated such a high level of anxiety. The hooded figure stumbled toward the same destination in which the arched druid had been heading, but his efforts were slowed incredibly by the terrible burden in his arms. The shape under the other travel cloak was clearly female, and also a night elf. Malfurion could not make out the male's visage, but the hood had slipped from the female's. The slack mouth was a grim enough sign. A sentinel tried to give aid to the female's companion, but the male shook the guard off. The sentinel retreated with an odd respect in both her expression and stance. The same sentinel glanced beyond the stricken figure to Malfurion. With some relief, she started, Arch Druid, praise alone. Arch Druid. The hooded male gasped out the word, as if it meant all the world to him. A sudden shock ran through Malfurion. He could not place the voice, but even though it was clearly changed by stress and other factors, it was one he should have known very well. Gingerly adjusting his precious burden, the male shifted enough to peer over his shoulder at Malfurion. The agony that gripped the male had made some distinct changes in the face. However, the archdruid still immediately recognized the night elf before him, even though it had been centuries since the latter had last been among their kind. Malfurion could scarcely believe his eyes. He had gradually come to the conclusion that accident or some other violent demise had taken the hooded figure long ago. The name escaped as a whisper of disbelief. Gerard Shadowsong. Aldrissa Woodshaper had been a sentinel since nearly the creation of that army. Although she had been born some centuries before its general Chandris, Aldrissa had recognized the skills in her leader and eagerly learned. She had thus risen up in the ranks, well earning her position as a commander. Narrow of face and with a persistently wrinkled brow, as if she were always deep in thought, Aldrissa had just prior to the cataclysm been promoted to overseeing night elf forces in Ashenvale. Although far from Teldrassil and Darnassus, Ashenvale, located in the northern half of the continent of Kalimdor and stretching across much of its width, was not only sacred to her people, but of significance to the preservation of their civilization. The night elves and their allies carefully harvested only select areas of the vast forests, making certain not to disturb nature any more than necessary. Aldrissa squinted as she peered into the forest ahead of her party. Like the others, she rode astride one of the muscular cats called night sabers after their long curved fangs. Both night elves and night sabers were, as their names suggested, nocturnal creatures, but circumstance more and more demanded that they move about during the day, too. Most of the other races with which they dealt were diurnal, day-dwellers, which did not preclude their being active at night, which presented her with the most complicated and potentially deadly aspect of her role here. There had been no sign of nearby activity by the Horde, but Haldrissa knew better than to trust the Orcs and their allies to stay in the eastern side. Bad enough that they had a foothold in Ashenvale at all. What do you see, Zanon? she asked of the male night elf to her left. He was not the most senior of her officers, but he was known for his sharp eyes, even among the sentinels. Anything amiss? Zanon leaned forward a moment, then replied, All clear to me, Commander. No one else indicated otherwise. Haldrissa signaled the party to move on. The Commander led a contingent of some fifty night elves on the way to inspect one of the foremost posts. Haldrissa made it a point to do regular inspections herself. Nothing kept post commanders on their toes better than the knowledge that she would be checking on them. The post was only another hour's ride. The reason for the halt had been what thus far appeared to be a lapse on the part of the officer in charge. Aldrissa insisted that guards be set up to face not only the directions from which the horde could be expected to attack, but also those from which it could not. 
If Haldrissa could imagine successfully sneaking past a post and either attacking it from behind, or moving on to attack locations deeper within Night Elf territory, then surely the orcs knew War Chief could. A short distance later, Haldrissa turned to Denea, her second in command. I want two scouts to ride to the post, then report back, without being seen. Denea summoned the riders needed, then sent them off. Haldrissa watched the pair first become two blurs, then vanish into the distance. She hid a moment of frustration. Her vision was not as sharp as it had been only a few months before. In fact, it seemed to have worsened in the past few days. Weapons at the ready, she ordered the others. Denea, who already had her bow out, repeated the order. They moved on noticing nothing and growing more suspicious because of that. Aldrissa estimated the time the scouts would need to reach the post and get back to her, and knew that there was still quite a wait. Thus it was that the growl of a night saber racing toward them only minutes later sent her and her fighters into preparations for immediate battle. The beast was sorely wounded, arrows pincushioning its hide. That it had gotten this far was a credit to its stamina. Blood stained its claws and teeth, showing that it had not left the struggle without inflicting pain on its attackers as well. And astride it, very dead, was one of the scouts. Zanin let out an epithet and looked all for urging his cat forward. He was not the only one either. Haldrissa waved the eager ones back, not that she intended to hold off pursuit. Denea already had the dying nightsaber beside hers. She looked over the rider and scowled. We will have to leave her here for the time being. We can retrieve her on the way back so that she can receive a proper burial. Haldrissa nodded to her second. Denea and another sentinel swiftly dismounted and removed the body from the suffering cat. Gently setting their comrade beside the nearest tree, they returned to the nightsaber. The cat panted heavily. Up close, the intensity of the wounds was more evident. There was blood everywhere. The night saber peered up at Denea with eyes filled with pain. One of its sabers was broken. The wounded mount coughed violently, throwing up more blood. It was clear that nothing could be done to save the beast. Drawing her dagger, Denea leaned down and murmured to the animal. The night saber gently licked the hand that held the weapon, then calmly closed its eyes in what was clearly expectation. Gritting her teeth, Denea expertly slit its throat. The animal died instantly. Spread out, Haldrissa ordered as her second in command mounted again. Zanon, you take those up that way. Denea, take your group to the south. The rest with me. Moments later, the night elves cautiously moved into the area in question. Haldrissa's night saber sniffed the air and snarled low. The commander quieted her beast with a touch of her hand to its head and slowly reached for her bow. An arrow struck the warrior beside her. The strike was a perfect one, piercing the throat. It had also come from above. Quickly knocking an arrow, Haldrissa raised her bow to fire. Before she could, though, two swiftly spinning glaives shot up in the direction from which the arrow would come. The arched, triple-bladed weapons cut a deadly swath into the foliage. A pained grunt escaped from the treetop. One of the glaives darted back out of the tree, returning to its wielder. The other reappeared a second later, buried in the chest of an orc. The enemy archer dropped like a stone to the ground, his slashed body sprawling. But even before the orc's corpse had the opportunity to settle, from out of the forest ahead charged nearly a dozen of his fellows, many astride powerful black wolves. Axes, spears, and swords raised high, the orcs plunged toward Haldrissa's group. The night elves wasted no time in meeting the charge. Haldrissa fired once at the first orc approaching, but what should have been a clear shot ended up only piercing the shoulder. The wound was not enough to even slow the brawny orc who then tried to bury his axe in the skull of her mount. 
Another shot from above hit a nearby nightsaber in the neck. The animal stumbled, sending its rider flying forward. An opportunistic orc leapt from his wolf and swung at the fallen night elf. The sentinel turned, trying to defend herself, but was too slow. The orc's axe bit into her chest near the collarbone. The wounded night saber sought to attack the orc, only to be confronted by the warrior's wolf. The two great beasts tore into one another with fang and claw, each seeking an opening. The night saber had some advantage in size, but the wound slowed it. Steering around the monstrous pair, Haldrissa fired at the orc. Up close, she could not miss. The force of the bolt as it sank into the orc's chest sent the dying attacker flying back several feet. Another arrow whistled past the commander's ear. Cursing, Haldrissa fired back at where she thought it had originated. Her arrow evidently missed, but it forced the orc in the tree to move more into the open, where a bolt from the south finished him. Waving her bow, Danaea let out a triumphant cry, then led her group in against the orcs. At the same time, Xanans surged in from the north. Steel met steel. Night sabers clashed with wolves. Danaea had changed her bow for a glaive. She slashed through the throat of a slavering wolf as it seized her by the leg. Her sleek, raven-colored hair, bound in a tail, darted like a whip as she looked this way and that for her next foe. The orcs fought savagely, even more savagely than Haldrissa had expected. They left themselves open at times, seeming to prefer simply to try to get to an enemy no matter what the risk. While by sheer force they kept the larger contingent of night elves momentarily at bay, the odds were clearly too great against them. Could it be? The commander started to realize, only to have to forego completion of the thought as another mounted orc dove in at her. Haldrissa dropped her bow and brought up her glaive, using the nearest of the curved blades to deflect the axe. Her arm shook as the two weapons rang together. The wolf dodged to the side of her nightsaber's claws in order to give its rider a better opening. The commander's cat twisted to protect Haldrissa, but the orc had already swung. The foremost blade cracked under the force of the strike. The upper half flew into Haldrissa's face. She felt stinging pain by her left eye, then her sight there vanished. A wetness spread over her left cheek, and she nearly passed out from shock. A part of her mind screamed, The Orc! Beware the Orc! One hand clutching her ruined eye, Haldrissa tried to focus on her foe. Through her tears, she made out his general shape. He was nearly upon her, even with the night saber now doing its best to fend off the wolf. Haldrissa twisted the glaive in order to bring one of the remaining blades between her and where she thought the axe was. Her head pounded, and the outline of the orc faded. She knew she was going to die. But the killing blow never came. Instead, the night saber ceased its violent rocking, as if the battle between it and the wolf had come to a sudden conclusion. Commander! Someone shouted in her ear. She recognized Danaea's voice. The orc! The orc is slain! A slim hand seized her weapon arm. As Haldrissa blinked away tears from her remaining eye, Danaea came into focus. Be still, Commander. You need aid. Quickly. The battle is over. The orcs are slain to a warrior, their wolves perishing with them. A prisoner would have been good to have, Haldrissa knew. But a capture could not always be accomplished in the midst of frenzied fighting. As another sentinel came around her blind side and began working on her wound, Haldrissa finally managed to better focus on the situation. One thing immediately came to mind. The outpost. We must reach the outpost. She was forced to wait while they finished with her eye, and even then Zanin suggested that they turn around. Haldrissa began to feel like an old grandparent rather than their commander and grew angry. The other night elves acquiesced to her orders, and the party finally raced toward the outpost, all expecting the worst. 
But as they neared the wooden structure, to their surprise, a pair of sentries stepped out from among the trees. They looked stunned by the party's appearance, especially that of the commander, who now sported a long cloth over the damaged side of her face. Before they could speak, Haldrasa quickly asked, The outpost, all is well. They glanced at one another in some confusion, one finally replying, Yes, commander. It has been very quiet. Were there other sentries posted in the trees behind us? Two? There had been no sign of either the pair or the other scout Haldrissa had sent. She had no doubts as to their fate. A scouting force, Denea declared to her. They managed to maneuver around the outpost without being caught, but the missing sentries must have run across them. A dark smile crossed her features. Well, they will not be ferreting out any secrets to pass back to their war chief. We have seen to that, and avenged our lost comrades as well. Zanin and the others seemed to agree with her, but Haldrissa remained silent. She thought of the fatalistic determination of the orcs as they had thrown themselves against impossible odds. Such an act was not extraordinary where orcs were concerned. They often reveled in showing their willingness to sacrifice themselves. But what were they sacrificing themselves for? She murmured to herself. What did you say, Commander? Denea asked. The pain from her wound coursed through Haldrissa, forcing her to put a hand to her head. Still, the notion of what had truly happened burned deep. Send word ahead to the outpost. Have them survey the area carefully. You think there are more orcs? No. She wished she were wrong. That would help matters. They were too late, though. The attackers had done their part, giving their lives for the horde. No. By now they have slipped back through. There had been forays by orcs in the past, but something about this particular one struck her as sinister. The Horde had never sent a party this deep in this region, and certainly not one of such size. She would have to send word to the General as soon as possible. For months, Chandras and the High Priestess had been awaiting some act by the Horde that hinted of a change in the delicate balance between the two factions. Haldrissa now believed she had witnessed that very act. But what does this incursion augur? The wounded commander wondered anxiously. She had no answer. Still, whatever form it would take, the one thing Haldrissa did know was that there would be much, much more blood than had been spilled this day. Much. Chapter 3 Gerard Shadow Song She is dying. My Shalis here is dying, the male night elf blurted to the arch druid. Gerard Shadow Song's face was lined like no night elves that Malfurion had ever seen. While some of those lines had probably been the result of Gerard's life away from his people, others were clearly more recent and likely had to do with the unmoving female so carefully held in his arms. Gerard's hair and beard had silvered, a stark change from how Malfurion recalled him. Gerard had been younger than Malfurion when they had first met, more than a thousand years, in fact, but the silvering and the lines made him look that much older than the archdruid. Malfurion wondered what the night elf before him had lived through since their last meeting. Gerard. It felt so strange to Malfurion to say the name, the two not having seen one another in nearly ten thousand years. It has been a long time since we last met, the former commander and still legendary hero from the War of the Ancients murmured, his eyes hollow. Forgive me for coming to you like this. Malfurion waved aside Gerard's apology. Looking over Shalisir, he saw how grave her condition was. 
I could try to heal her, but I think it best if we bring her straight to Tyrande, so that we have all options available to us. Quickly now. Gerard looked hesitant to surrender any part of his hold on his companion, but at last he let the Archdruid aid him. As the throng watched in absolute silence, the pair carried Chalicere toward the temple. The two sentinels at the entrance moved respectfully aside as the Archdruid neared. One gaped at the side of Gerard. Even with the cropped beard and long loose mane, both utterly silvered now, there was something in his weathered face that remained absolutely recognizable to any who had seen him in the past. She will save you, Malfurion heard the one-time captain murmur to the still female. Tyrande will save you. She will speak with Elun. Malfurion hid his frown. Shialisir felt extremely limp, and from the position by which he held her, the Archdruid could not tell if she breathed. She was beyond his power at this point, which only left Elune. Yet, how much would even the Moon Goddess do in such a drastic case? Through the corridors of stone and living wood they rushed. Some of the priestesses they saw quickly offered assistance, but the Archdruid understood that only his beloved would have the power to help Gerard's mate at this point. Her personal guard came to attention as Malfurion and his companions neared the sanctum she utilized in her role as High Priestess. One of the guards wordlessly opened the way. Malfurion noted how every set of eyes focused first on Gerard before taking in Shalisir. Everyone had long assumed that Gerard Shadow Song had perished at some point during the past millennia, else why would he not have returned to his people during some of their most desperate moments? They were not even through the entrance before Tyrande met them. Gerard started to speak, but the High Priestess shook her head. She directed them to take Shalisir to a long sloping couch next to her, then bade the attendants without to close the doors. Her expression grave, the High Priestess went down on one knee next to the other female. Tyrande began murmuring a prayer under her breath, and her hands continuously passed over Shalisir's body. The light spread from the High Priestess to Shalisir. Gerard let out a hopeful gasp. The two males watched with anticipation as the soft silver light settled down over the stricken figure. Without warning, the light faded. Tyrande pulled back. A sound escaped her, one that Malfurion recognized from times in the past. Gerard, Tyrande said in a low voice as she rose and turned. Gerard, I am sorry. No. He shoved past the archdruid. I told her she could get help here. I told her you or Malfurion could save her. Why will you not save her? Tyrande halted his lunge toward Shalisir with a simple touch of her hands against his shoulders. Eyes more hollow, tears beginning to stream. The former guard captain from Lost Suramar stared into the High Priestess's sympathetic gaze. She had already slipped away. There was nothing that could be done. He looked aghast. No. I brought her as soon as I could. I pushed for us to reach here. His own gaze veered toward Shalisir. I did it then. I pushed her too hard. She would be alive if I had not. Tyrande shook her head. You know that is not true. Her fate was cast. She knows that you did all that anyone could have done. It was simply meant to be. Shalisir! Gerard dropped down next to his mate. He clutched her face to his shoulder. Malfurion quietly joined his own mate. They watched in solemn respect as Gerard rocked back and forth and whispered to his lost wife. Finally, Gerard looked back to his hosts. Tears still slid down his cheeks and into his beard, but his voice sounded stronger now more resigned to the truth. We both feared that she would not make it. But we both agreed 
that it was best. Yet, I remember from her tone at times, now that I look back on it, she knew the truth. She did this more for me than for her own life. Have a go, why don't you? She wanted me to come back here to be with others, not be alone when she... She passed. You called her Chalisir, Tyrande replied soothingly. I thought I recognized her. She was a novice here for a time. We all assumed she had wandered away from the old city and that some accident had subsequently befallen her, even though searches found no body. No one knew that she and you were together, though the timing of your mutual disappearances should have spoken volumes to us. Yet we never made the connection. We kept our love secret, mainly out of concern on my part. I had already considered leaving everything long before. I had grown disenchanted with the polarization of our society. Your druids... Forgive me, Malfurion. Your druids had been becoming more and more remote, spending most of their time away or in the Emerald Dream rather than sharing in the responsibilities of keeping our people safe and secure. The Archdruid said nothing. He had heard this from others, including Tyrande. The guilt for all those centuries of abandonment still remained with him. Gerard exhaled. And though I loved her with all my heart, I hoped that she would see the folly of being with me. I believed that if and when I chose to depart, I would save her from having to answer questions about my choice. Gerard. Malfurion began, but the other male continued, as if hearing nothing. Instead, she proved determined to follow my path, wherever it might lead. She always tried to do what I wanted, even when I tried my best to see to her happiness. Gerard kissed Chalisir's forehead. Little fool. First she wastes her life following me into the wilderness. And then she sacrifices what strength she has to ensure I return here, so that I will not be alone. Softly placing a hand on his shoulder, Tyrande said, You are always welcome among us. She knew that. She also seems to have savored her life with you, or else she would not have stayed with you all these centuries. We did have many moments of joy. She loved the wilderness, I admit. In some ways more than I did, even. I shall see to arrangements for her. She will receive proper rights. He looked up at her, then down at Shalasir again. She is dead. Still holding his beloved, Gerard Rose. He accepted no assistance as, with tender care, he adjusted Shalasir's position on the couch. To all appearances, she was sleeping. It barely seems any time since the illness touched her. The High Priestess and the Archdruid looked at each other. With the loss of their immortality, the Night Elves as a race had begun to experience afflictions that they had only witnessed in others. There had been a few other deaths, and Shalasirs showed that there would be more and more as time went on. Deaths that could not be avoided. What is it? I had heard rumors, Gerard went on, straightening. It is all true, then. We are mortal, are we not? After Malfurion nodded, the former guard captain grunted. Meaning no offense. But I think that a good thing, even with this happening. His hands curled into fists as he looked at Shalasir. We were so damned complacent about our great station in the world and our endless jaded lives. And that is why the Legion nearly slaughtered us all. 
A different darkness spread across his weathered face, one that Tyronda and her mate recalled from the far past. Malfurion quickly stepped over to Gerard and deftly guided him from Shalasir. You are exhausted. You need food and drink also. How can I sleep or eat? Shalasir would want you to take care of yourself, Tyronda added from Gerard's other side. And I promise you that I will spare no effort for her. I should stay. The Archdruid shook his head. No, give yourself the time you need to be able to better honor her. I know where to find some healthy fare, and perhaps how to bring some calm to your heart. Once you have recuperated, you can return and help oversee the final arrangements. To his relief, Gerard acquiesced. However, he looked back at his mate one last time. I would like a moment alone with her, if I may. Farewell. Of course. They watched him kneel beside Shalosir once more. Jared took her hands in his, leaned close, and whispered. Malfurion and Tyrande stepped out of the chamber. There they took the opportunity to briefly discuss another matter. Varian is coming to the summit, Tyrande quietly informed her husband. So Chandris's contacts say. It worries me, though, that we still have no official confirmation from Stormwind. We both know that if Chandris trusts her information, it is generally true. Good. One way or another, the news will filter to the other kingdoms. If Stormwind is attending, the remaining holdouts will rush to join. He frowned. As to whether he is coming to ensure the success of the summit, or to condemn it, we will have to wait and see. If we do not hear official word from Stormwind before he arrives, it may be the latter. Unfortunately, too true. Malfurion's frown deepened. But you could have told me all this when you initially contacted me. There is more. She described Elune's vision and what it had revealed. He brooded over the revelation for a breath or two, then asked, You have faith you could not be mistaken. The Mother Moon made it abundantly clear. It makes sense in great part, and yet not in other ways. He brooded for a moment. Leave this matter to me. I will see that somehow things come together. If it is indeed Varian Rin on whom the Alliance's future most depends. Tyrande accepted his decision to take control of that situation with a nod. Then, also eyeing Gerard, she, she continued, continued, We have another, more personal situation here. Perhaps, too. Gerard left behind some unfinished relationships of significance. Those will have to come to their proper conclusions without our efforts. There is so much more at stake. I welcome Gerard back, but his life is his own to master in the long run. They glanced back into the chamber. At that moment, the newly returned Gerard rose again. Malfurion and Tyrande heard him exhale deeply as he gave his Shalasir one last kiss. Let us hope Chandris and his sister see it that way. The High Priestess Riley returned under her breath as they moved to attend to their old friend. Though I doubt they will. Most night elves of military status utilize the training areas in the warrior's terrace to hone their skills. There they had the use of target ranges and dueling grounds. The night elves were respected by both their allies and enemies as strong and skilled fighters, especially General Chandra's Feathermoon's sentinels. But Maiev Shadowsong was no sentinel, and considered herself far more skilled and dedicated than any of them including their commander. Indeed, in her opinion, the Sentinels knew nothing about dedication. 
and sacrifice. Her face was narrower than many night elves and weathered. Scars marked her face, scars from both battle and torture. She had been warrior, jailer, prisoner, executioner. Her eyes held a fatalistic gleam. Her armor was more elaborate than that of a sentinel, with a thick breastplate, heavy shoulder guards, and high metal boots, all of a dark silver gray bordered by a golden bronze. Wicked gauntlets ending in claws covered both hands, and even the draping forest green cloak was lined with sharp blades that were not merely for show. A face-obscuring helm lay to the side of where she trained, with it a jagged, round blade known as an umbra crescent. There had been a title for what she had once been, what she still considered herself, though some no longer saw purpose in it. Those were the same people who did not sufficiently understand the dangers facing the night elf race, dangers against which the sentinels were poorly equipped both physically and mentally. Fortunately, Maev had found others who still saw as she did, and so had begun recruiting and training the best of those to rebuild the elite force wiped out by Malfurion's brother. The elite force known as the Watchers. For some ten millennia, Maev had been a Watcher. Their leader, the Warden, in fact, the Watchers, Originally volunteers from the ranks of the Sisters of Elun, and later also chosen from those outside the temple, had been charged with the daunting task of acting as jailers for the traitor Illidan Stormrage, and later other monstrous criminals from not just the Night Elves, but other races as well. As leader Maev had made Illidan her utmost priority, and utmost focus. No. In Maev's view, the Watchers had been a far more dedicated force than even the Sentinels. Maev practiced her skills, not in the Warrior's Terrace, but out in the forest beyond. There she could unleash the energy ever pent up inside her. This day she practiced with smaller blades, daggers, striking out at pre-selected targets while bounding through the area. One after another... The daggers sank deep into the centers of their targets, no matter at what angle Maev threw them. It was not by skill alone that her aim was so perfect, though. Incentive pushed her as much. In her mind, each target bore the visage of a male night elf whose eyes were covered by cloth, as if he were blind. Sometimes the details of the face changed but it was ever recognizable in her thoughts. She knew that face better than her own, having stared at it so much. In fact, her current exercise was also a futile attempt to eradicate the memory. But still she tried, slaying him again and again. That she had done so in truth did not matter. Whether as a cunning prisoner in the barrows or a demon seeking power over the world, Illidan's storm rage would forever be burned into Maiev's fairy soul. Drawing the last dagger, Maiev lunged under a branch. Alighting onto a lower one, she brought her hand back for throwing, then spun around to face the intruder she had felt coming up behind her. At the same time, Maiev tossed the dagger up, catching it by the hilt as it came down. The tip ended up touching the throat of another female. To her credit... The newcomer flinched only slightly. Maev nodded her approval. Neva was her best student. Forgive this interruption, Neva said calmly, eyes never going to the hand that held the dagger under her chin. I would not have disobeyed your command if it were not important. Maev removed the dagger. I trust your judgment. You know me better than anyone. This straightforward comment elicited a brief but odd look from Neva. Maev's brow arched. Why are you here? I was crossing through from the temple gardens when I saw the gathering. The arch-druid Malfurion's storm rage was there. Was he? 
Mayev's memories coursed back to much younger days, when she had been a senior priestess of Elun. There again she saw Illidan Stormrage, though as a younger, handsome, but haughty figure, next to his twin brother, the future Archdruid. Yes, the Archdruid had evidently arrived just a moment before I had. He stood only a few feet from where I did. He was staring at a male in a travel cloak. The male was carrying another, a female. She looked to be dying. Get to the point. The other female gave a slight nod. The Archdruid recognized the male. He whispered the name, which I was just barely able to hear. Never hesitated, then concluded, It was your brother's name. Maev revealed no reaction. She simply stood there as still as a statue. After several seconds, she finally blinked. Then with deft ease, she spun and threw the blade at the final target. The strike was perfect. Gerald, Maev muttered. I am not mistaken, Warden. I did not think you were. So, my brother has come back. Never bowed her head. I had thought him long dead. We were both mistaken then. Maev retrieved her helmet. He will be in or near the temple. Probably in it. You are going to visit him? Not at the moment. I need to think. Maev suddenly paused. Her eyes swept over the trees to the region to her right. Never followed her gaze, but saw nothing. Never mind, Maev ordered her companion as the senior watcher put the helmet on. Let us go. I must see my dear, long-lost sibling. But you said you were not going to visit. Gerard's sister looked at her companion with narrowed eyes. I said... I must see him. Never nodded her understanding. Without another word, Maev bounded down through the branches toward Darnassus. The younger night elf leapt after. Despite millennia separating their ages, Never found herself hard-pressed to keep up with her instructor. He watched the night elves leap gracefully out of sight moving with an inborn skill that few other races could match, but which made him sniff in contempt. He had not meant to cross their path, but perhaps it had been for the best. While the news of which they had spoken did not outwardly seem of import, anything that in the least concerned Archdruid Malfurion Stormrage would be of interest to his own master. Information was always valuable, especially in these times. With a slight growl, the figure leapt in the opposite direction. He moved through the foliage with as much skill and grace as the slimmer but taller night elves had, perhaps more even. After all, they did not have long, long claws with which to better grasp a tree branch or rend a foe when necessary. Chapter 4 The Message from Ashenvale Haldrissa had returned to her headquarters after her inspection of the outposts with more than the loss of her eye causing her frustration. While all of the outposts had proven to be in top condition, some of the activity reports that she had received from the officers in charge did not settle well with her. Where in several places there should have been some nominal orc activity, nearly all had reported nothing whatsoever. And where there had generally been no activity, odd little occurrences, though nothing as drastic as what she and her retinue had encountered, had taken place. Reports of a few footprints here, a broken arrow with horde markings found there, a vanishing of game in another location. By themselves, they were hardly anything to think about. But when all were added together, 
they hinted at some growing trouble. The commander sat cross-legged on a woven grass mat in her quarters. To her right, a toppled mug and a small drying pool of water marked an earlier failed attempt to adjust to perception problems due to her impaired vision. Aldrissa was doing better now, but still there were moments when her fingers had to hesitate before she was certain she was reaching for a parchment correctly. She stared at the array of reports from the various outposts, her remaining eye darting from one to the next. However, as Haldrissa looked at one to her farthest left, she suddenly realized that Denea stood waiting there. Just for a brief moment, Haldrissa noted what she knew to be impatience on her second's part. That emotion quickly melted away, leaving only the steady expression of a sentinel lieutenant. How long Denea had been waiting, Haldrissa could not say. The commander tried not to think of what would have happened if it had been the middle of combat, and rather than Denea, it had been an orc standing in her blind spot. Aldrissa revealed no frustration with either her lapse or her second's impatience as she rose to meet Denea's eye. What is it? You sent for me. Aldrissa had, but it had slipped her mind. Simply nodding, she said, I have gone over all the reports. I believe it urgent we send warning to Darnassus. The orc incursion near the one outpost was the most intrusive, but by far not the only one. They have pushed into the area before. You think this incident that important? Important enough to send a message to General Chandris immediately. Have a hippogriff rider ready within a quarter hour. Denea saluted and left. Aldrissa looked over the reports one last time. Then, taking Quill to parchment, she wrote all she felt pertinent and how, in her opinion, it tied together. By the time she was done, Denea had returned. The rider is ready. I chose a Rodria Cloudflyer. The commander nodded her approval. A Rodria was an expert rider, perhaps the best in all Ashenvale. Sealing the parchment into a small pouch, Haldrissa again rose. With Tinea a step behind her, she strode to where the courier already waited upon a huge forest green animal with the clawed forelegs and crested head of a bird of prey, a head also adorned with long wicked antlers, and a body otherwise like the sleekest of stags. His wings were a brilliant orange like a setting sun. The hippogriff's eyes radiated fierce intelligence. These creatures were not property or pets, but rather allies. Riders did not control so much as work in concert with them. Aradria leaned down as the commander stepped close. She was even more wiry than Denea. On the other side of the saddle were strapped her glaive and a quiver full of arrows. Her bow was looped over her head and shoulder. No one sees this but the general, Haldrissa ordered as she handed the pouch to the courier. None shall, Aradria promised. She saluted Haldrissa as she straightened. The courier thrust the pouch into a larger one attached to the curved saddle on which she sat. Fly with all haste, the commander continued. Beware the sea. Windstorm is the fastest we have here. Aradria patted the hippogriff on the neck. The winged creature nodded, his eyes gleaming in anticipation. No one will catch him. With that promise, she urged the magnificent mount to flight. The others stepped back as Windstorm spread his broad wings and readily rose into the air. Watching the pair, Haldrissa felt a pang of jealousy. As commander, she rarely had the opportunity to ride such a mount. I want to double the patrols, Denea, she said once the courier and the hippogriff had become a blur. Daytime and night, especially night. The orcs would be better off trying to infiltrate during the day, Denea pointed out, indicating the time when most of the night elves still slept. Which is why we need to pay special attention when it is night. Her second did not contest her judgment. Aldrissa dismissed Denea, then returned to her quarters. They were sparse, little more than the mat and the necessary tools needed for her reports and such. Another woven mat, this one longer and thicker, served as her bed. 
Unlike some officers, Haldrissa did not pamper herself. She slept as her soldiers slept. It will not take her long, the senior officer thought. It will not take Aradria long to reach Darnassus, not by air. She was glad about that. General Chandris would see her concerns and move to address them. Still, Aldrissa realized that there was yet need to build up the outposts beyond their current strength. As the weary commander lay down on her sleeping mat, she began calculating how to best rearrange her present level of troops. That further calmed her. Between her missive to the general and her own plans, the Horde was surely in for a dire surprise should it be planning a new attack. The orcs were nothing if not predictable in their overall methods. Satisfied and eager to let rest ease some of the pain returning to her eye, Haldrissa finally slumbered. Ashenvale would soon be secure again. The courier grinned as she and the hippogriff soared above the trees. Already deep into night elf territory, they both knew that they could save time skimming above the forest. Aradria had promised Haldrissa that they would get the report to Darnassus as swiftly as possible, and she and Windstorm had every intention of fulfilling that promise. Besides, they had a reputation to keep among the other riders and mounts. The hippogriff's powerful wings beat hard. The miles vanished behind them. Aradria left it to her companion to judge where and when he would need to rest. Experienced riders never assumed that they knew better than the hippogriffs themselves. The cool wind felt bracing to the night elf, and she knew that it touched windstorm the same way. Peering at the landscape below, Aradria made a judgment call as to a change in direction that might cut down their time even more. She tapped the hippogriff on the left side of his broad, muscular neck, using a short series of touches to communicate what she thought. Such a method was far better than trying to shout against the wind. Without warning, the hippogriff rocked violently, his wings flapping in an awkward, jolting manner. As she clutched tight, the night elf glanced at one of the wings. Two thick bolts had pierced it, right near the muscle. Blood stained the brilliant plumage and also sprinkled the treetops below. Aradria looked at the other wing. There, a third bolt had likewise punctured the appendage, and more blood streaked across not only the feathers, but the sky behind. The shots were expert, so much so that the wounds kept the hippogriff from maintaining altitude. Windstorm's talons and hooves raked against the trees as he struggled to stay aloft. Torn leaves and bits of branches assailed the courier as the mount's battle against descent faltered more and more with each passing second. <clears throat> A stray branch as big as her arm hit the night elf in the chest. Aradria lost her breath, then her balance. She fell back. Windstorm crashed among the trees. The collision was the final straw for the sentinel, who tumbled off the saddle. If not for the thickness of the forest canopy here, Aradria would have been dead. As it was, she slammed through one heavy branch after another until the accumulation of debris falling with her created a barrier that put an end to her fall. She lay there, stunned, with her head and left arm hanging down. The wounded hippogriff became tangled in a mass of trees just a short distance ahead. Instinct overwhelming thought, Windstorm twisted and turned in an attempt to free himself. The saddle, caught on some of the branches, held him fast for a moment until brute fury enabled the mount to rip free of it. The saddle dropped several yards farther down the tree. Aradria heard the hippogriff's frustration and caught glimpses of his struggles as she pulled herself up to a sitting position. From her shoulder she removed the bow, broken in the fall. Scratched, bleeding, and with one smaller finger bent at an unlikely angle, the night elf nonetheless thought only about her companion and the pouch. Pausing just to reset the finger in order to better her grip, she moved nimbly toward Windstorm. She had barely begun when the hippogriff, still turned awkwardly despite having freed himself from the saddle, broke through the stressed limbs holding him. 
The massive beast let out a squawk as he violently descended through one level of branches after another, finally vanishing from Aradria's sight. Her desperate gaze fixed on the saddle some distance below. Though she still wanted to help the hippogriff, Aradria knew that her duty was to retrieve the pouch. With one last glance in search of Windstorm, the night elf leapt toward the saddle. The branches held her, but barely. Even those not directly near where the hippogriff had crashed had been damaged by the falling limbs. Aradria made a swift calculation as to which would best suit her, then jumped to it. She landed just a few scant yards from the saddle. Only then did she see that the larger pouch was empty. The small one containing the missive now lay somewhere farther below, perhaps even on the ground. Aradria retrieved her glaive, slinging it on her gauntlet. After a moment's consideration, the sentinel also took the quiver of arrows along. From far below came Windstorm's angry cry. The night elf began leaping down from branch to branch. At last she spotted a patch of ground and the pouch. Praise Alum, Aradria murmured. Ignoring the pain in her finger, she grasped another branch and descended farther. An arrow shot past her ear. She did not see the archer but estimated his position from the bolt's flight. Aradria whipped the glaive free and threw it. It cut through the remaining foliage and briefly vanished from sight. A gruff voice roared in agony. Seconds later the glaive returned to the night elf's waiting hand. The blades were stained with fresh blood. Taking a deep breath, the courier dropped the last distance. She could still see the pouch. It leaned against the trunk of the very tree from which she had just descended. Aradria reached for it. From around the trunk burst a tusked orc, his huge axe already raised high to cleave the night elf in two. His thick mane of hair, bound tight, swung wildly as he ran at her, and the grin spread across his wide face revealed that while he still had tusks, several of his other teeth had been broken in past conflicts. The damage did more to enhance his already fearsome appearance. The courier brought up the glaive just in time to deflect the strike. Her entire arm vibrated from the force of the muscular orc's blow. Aradria gritted her teeth as she fought not to cede her position near the pouch. The grinning orc slashed away at her again. Every bone in the already injured night elf's body screamed, yet she held her place. Still, she knew that the impasse could not last. More orcs would surely join the fight. When her foe raised his axe for his next swing, Aradria retreated a step. The orc's grin widened as he took this action as evidence that the duel was tilting more in his favor. Aradria threw the glaive with all her might. The distance was not much, but her determined effort gave the triple-bladed weapon the force it needed. One curved blade buried itself deep in the orc's chest. The green-skinned warrior stumbled. Although he was not dead, the wound was a grave one. With his free hand, he tried to pull the glaive free. The night elf barreled into him, pressing the glaive deeper as her opponent staggered back. At the same time, she reached up to the quiver and grabbed one of the shafts. Aradria shoved the arrow through the orc's throat. The orc let out a gurgling sound. Despite dying, he clutched the night elf tight. The two fell to the ground. She struggled to free herself. Not far off, she heard movement that did not sound like a forest creature. Anticipating more orcs, the courier finally managed to shove the body away. Unfortunately, she could not immediately free the glaive. A rustling of brush made her look over her left shoulder in time to see three more orcs racing toward her from behind the nearby trees. Aradria tugged hard, the glaive finally coming out with a grotesque slurping sound. She whirled to face the trio, already aware that she had little chance against them. Then... Two more orcs stepped into the area from the opposite direction, cutting off what little hope she had of still fleeing with the pouch. Aradria surreptitiously glanced at the object. There was still a chance to at least destroy the contents if she could buy herself a few moments. 
with a brief murmured oath to Elune, the night elf charged the nearest three. Her audacity served her well. The orcs hesitated, all but certain that she had intended to go against the pair. Aradria threw the glaive as she lunged. The spinning missile forced the trio to scatter. The glaive soared past the orcs, then arced back, but not to the night elf's previous position. Rather, both it and she converged on the location where the pouch lay. But she had underestimated the swiftness of at least one of the other two orcs. Even as Aradria caught the glaive, he reached the pouch. Clutching the prize in one hand, the brutish warrior turned to battle her. The courier swung the glaive at him, then suddenly kicked. Although the orc outweighed her, the force was still enough to shove the air from his lungs. Aradria pressed her attack, hoping to take him down and retrieve the pouch. Much to her dismay, the other nearby orc came between them. His intrusion enabled his comrade to recover, and both dueled with the tiring night elf. Aradria knew that the other three had to be closing. She was trapped. Suddenly a deep squawk shook the combatants. A huge form shot past the night elf. Mighty talons tore through the torso of one orc. Though bleeding in many places and clearly favoring one front leg, Windstorm was yet a tremendous threat. The orcs could not get past his sharp beak. His body blocked them from reaching Aradria. The night elf used his timely entrance to beat back her other two adversaries. She then took a quick look at the hippogriff, trying to estimate his condition. Windstorm could not fly. That was clear from his one badly drooping wing, but perhaps he could still carry her from the struggle. First, though, she needed the pouch. Windstorm! As the hippogriff responded, Aradria gestured at the orc with the stolen prize. The huge beast might not be able to fly, but he could leap very well. Using his talons, he scattered the two orcs near him, then turned and made a tremendous jump over Aradria. The other orcs backed away at his landing. Windstorm ignored the one without the pouch. The hippogriff snapped at the key warrior, but that orc refused to give up the pouch even in the face of such a threat. At the same time, Aradria moved up, hoping to attack the orc while he was distracted by Windstorm. Windstorm thrust his head forward, his beak opened wide. A spear caught the hippogriff in the side of the chest. Windstorm let out a startled cry and teetered. In doing so, he collided with his rider, bowling her over. The world spun as Aradria rolled. A horrific pain shot through her chest. She almost blacked out. A nerve-wrenching keening cut briefly through the agony. Aradria heard a moist thwacking sound, then Windstorm's shriek. A moment later, the ground shook as something heavy and limp crashed next to her. The pain consumed her, until finally, there was nothing left. One of the orcs with whom Aradria had been battling started to lean over the night elf's still form. Blood seeped from a deep wound near the courier's left lung, where one of the curved blades from her glaive had pierced her during her roll. Why bother? Another orc questioned. The wound's deep. She can't be alive. If she is, rumbled the deeper voice, she deserves a warrior's death for such determination against impossible odds. A shadow passed the second orc, the shadow of a much brawnier warrior than he. One hand, brown rather than green, gripped an axe more suited for two hands in combat. The sharply curved axe head was massive, well-worn, and permanently stained with old blood. One of its most distinctive features was the many small holes in the head near the handle. Other orcs gathered in the area, their numbers totaling just over a dozen. Three bore injuries that indicated a previous encounter with the hippogriff. The warrior who had retrieved the pouch presented it to the leader. I saw no breathing. She is dead. This was what she fought so hard for, great war chief. The leader hooked the huge axe on his back, then took the pouch. 
Because he was a Magar orc, his skin was brown, not green. His jaw was broader than that of most orcs, and from it jutted a pair of thick tusks with points as sharp as daggers. Unlike the others in the party, he was bald. He wore shoulder armor fashioned in part from the skull of a huge predator that he himself had slain, and over each shoulder had also been set a massive curved tusk. The last was in homage to his father, Grom, for they were those of the pit lord Manoroth, the great demon his sire had slain. By killing Manoroth, Grom had freed his people from the fiend's blood curse, which had made them servants of the monstrous Burning Legion. Tearing open the small pouch with ease, he read the message. A single, satisfied grunt was his only initial reaction. The spirits have guided us. We were where we needed to be to catch this prey. He crammed the parchment into a pouch at his belt. Destiny is with us. All falls into place. The night elves react exactly as I said they would. Garrosh Hellscream knows all, declared the orc who had handed him the pouch. He guides his enemies to their doom and laughs at their feeble attempts to keep their necks from his mighty axe, Gorhowl. Gorhowl will taste much night elf blood soon. The Horde's glory is eternal, Garrosh replied, his tone filled with rising anticipation. This is our land now. He looked around. So much timber, so much untouched ore. The Alliance was foolish not to use its bounty. We, we will build a city here to rival even Orgrimmar. The other orcs gave a lusty, though low, cheer. Although in the wilderness they could still not trust that there might not be others who would hear them. None of the orcs feared battle, but this mission was of the greatest import to the plan, or else the war chief himself would not have chosen to lead it. The courier had been an exception. The scout who had spotted her in the distance had suspected from her route and pace that she surely carried something of importance and had reported the sighting immediately. Garrosh had not hesitated for a moment before ordering his archers to bring down the hippogriff. I have seen all I need. We return now. The ships will soon arrive. He grinned, already envisioning the carnage their contents would create. My gift to the Alliance must be readied. The rest of the band let loose with another low cheer. Garrosh pulled free Gore Howl and briefly waved it. The unsettling keening arose once more, then quieted as the war chief lowered his axe. Gripping the weapon in both hands, he then led his followers east. Behind them, Aradria stirred, let out a brief moan, then grew still once more. Chapter 5 Bitter Reunions True to her promise, the High Priestess arranged matters for Gerard Shadowsong. Shalasir lay at rest in the temple in an area reserved for such sad tableau, her body now garbed in the raiment of the sisterhood. She had been placed on a marble platform with the sign of the goddess, the crescent moon, etched multiple times into each side. The light of a loon shone down upon her, and her face bore an expression of peace. Those who had known her came to give their respects, each going down on one knee, then murmuring a prayer for her spirit to the Mother Moon. The temple never closed its doors to the faithful, although most of those coming to honor Shalasir came during the evening. However, time meant nothing to Gerard, who ever leaned over his beloved either praying to Elune or silently speaking to his mate. The travel cloak lay bunched up to the side, but otherwise he was clad in the same forest green and brown garments in which he had arrived. His beard and hair were slightly unkempt. Such mundane matters were of no interest to him at this time. 
Generally, there were two priestesses in attendance for such occasions, but at the former captain's request, Tyranda had removed them. Although grateful for all that had been done for his mate, Gerard desired privacy when no other mourners were present. Head resting upon his folded hands, he spoke again to Shalasir, this time reminding her of when they had built their first dwelling together. It had been a simple one, designed to give them shelter while they made plans for something more permanent. The mistakes they had made in its creation had done more to bind them together. Gerard looked up, well-honed instincts alerting him to the presence of another. He glanced over his shoulder at the entrance. My respects for your loss, Chandras quietly said. The Mother Moon guides her spirit now. The General of the Sentinels moved as smoothly as a nightsaber, and Gerard seemed much unchanged physically from when they had last met. She carried her helmet in the crook of her arm, which allowed him to study close her face. As usual, Chandris's true emotions remained hidden, save for a brief flash of what he read as either anger or uncertainty. Chandris had been adopted by Tyranda, but they looked enough alike in the face to have passed for true mother and child. However, the High Priestess had a softness to her expression that Gerard had seldom seen on Chandris. The General was also clad very true to her nature, her sleek violet armor covering most of her form. The armor had been designed as much for swift movement as protection. Even the shoulder guards were set so that Chandras could raise a bow or sword at a moment's notice without any hindrance. The helmet, which only covered the upper half of the face, had also been forged with those two thoughts in mind. It could be easily set atop or pulled off of the head without ever catching on the long, tapering ears of a night elf, or, in Chandris's case, tangling with her long, dark blue hair. Thank you. As she strode toward him, Gerard straightened to better face her. Her somber expression matched well his own. I recall her, the general continued, looking at the still figure. She had much merit. She had life. She breathed life. The world brightened wherever she went. Chandras turned more toward the body, in the process her expression becoming hidden from Gerard's view. You truly loved her? Of course. Then I envy her. He gaped. Chandras. The female night elf looked back at him. Her eyes were moist, but the tears were clearly not entirely for the deceased. I am sorry. I have been rude. You know that you have my deepest sympathies. To lose her so suddenly after so long, it is not right. Chandris. I must go, she muttered, looking even more uncomfortable than Gerard felt. He tried to gently take her arm, but Chandris evaded his touch without seeming to try. She could not keep him from following her, though, and thus the two walked in silence out of the chamber. Gerard looked around, saw that no one was near, then quietly said, I have owed you an apology for a long time. You owe me no such thing. Nothing ever truly happened between us. He looked back at the chamber, his face radiating guilt. Then, I do not deny I was enchanted by your attention, especially once you had grown up. But we were heading in opposite directions in life. Those years right after the war were hard on all of us. All I wanted was to try to forget the carnage and the deaths. I never wanted to be a leader. A hero. Gerard said the last word with much self-derision. I felt out of place. Something you did not. You had purpose. You had your duty to the temple and the high priestess. She has... Gerard held up a hand for silence, and clearly to his surprise, Chandris obeyed. That you would be devoted to Tyranda not only for saving your life, but for becoming the mother you lost, is hardly something with which I would find fault. Yet she, and through her our people, have been 
and always will be your foremost focus. Chandras opened her mouth, then shut it. There was no denial in her eyes. Instead, she leaned up and suddenly kissed him on the cheek. There was not even the mildest attempt at seduction. This was a token of sympathy for his plight. I am here, if you need to talk, the general said. With that, she turned and departed. Chandris did not look back, and Gerard did not say farewell. He only watched as she headed in the direction that he knew the High Priestess's sanctum lay. The former officer started back, only to notice another armored figure far off in the opposite direction. Mother Moon, Gerard whispered, thinking that he recognized the other despite the helmet. He waved to her. Yet, unlike Chandras, the newcomer, once noticed, did not approach. Rather, she turned to leave. Maev! If she heard him, she did not respond. He stood there for a moment, completely perplexed, then rushed after his sister. She had gone around a corner before he had managed half the distance. Certain that he would lose her and not sure when they would meet next, Gerard ran. He cut around the corner only to see his quarry vanish out of the temple. Following suit, Gerard exited onto the long bridge leading to the gardens. By that time, Maev, if it was her, was already across the bridge and well into the area. He rushed through the gardens after her. Then beyond them, he twisted east as the ever half-glimpsed figure of his sister moved swiftly through the city and beyond the boundaries of Darnassus into the forest. Gerard was not far behind, but still too far for his tastes. As he entered among the trees, he wondered if this would all prove a futile chase. Still, he was determined to follow. Gerard darted among the first trees, trying to estimate the right path. He caught one glimpse of what he thought was an arm just noticeable between the tree trunks to his right and immediately veered toward it. Although he had no knowledge of this forest, Gerard allowed his natural instincts to guide him. He made swift judgments about the most accessible routes and where, from what he could make out of the landscape ahead, Maev would likely head. Although he could not see her, he was certain that he was at last closing on her. A sudden rush of intense satisfaction at this vied with his guilt for having left Shalasir's side. He was not going to let Maev get the best of... A muzzle full of long, sharp teeth confronted him. The image that filled Gerard's view over the next few seconds was one of nightmare. He saw something lupine, yet roughly humanoid in shape. It was at least as tall as he was, but nearly twice as wide and far more muscled. Long, deadly claws flashed by his face but did not touch him. The eyes. The eyes were those of no beast. A powerful fist thrust against Gerard's chest, shoving the air from his lungs. The night elf bent over as he struggled for breath. In the back of his mind, he waited for the killing strike by either claw or bite. But the strike did not come. And when Gerard managed to lift his head enough to see before him, it was to discover that he was again alone. The only hint that anything had stood before him was the already slowing shift of branches. Gerard darted after the unseen creature. He ducked around another tree and then nearly ran into his sister, Maev, who suddenly stood right in front of him. She had removed her helmet, revealing deep scars across her face that startled Gerard as much as her sudden presence in front of him. Never go chasing someone alone in unfamiliar territory. I thought that was one of the first things I taught you. Gerard looked down to see the point of her umbra crescent touching his chest. He had noted the weapon at her side when he first spotted her, but had never expected to have it wielded against him. Chuckling at his discomfort, Maev withdrew the weapon. In one smooth movement, she hooked it at her side again. I thought that, of all people, I could trust in my sister. We do what we must. Perhaps more than a scorned love, she returned. That was 
General Chandra's Feathermoon I saw retreating in defeat in the temple, was it not? Maev. She was quite in a shambles when you vanished so long ago. Enough, Maev. His joy at reuniting with his sister quickly became tempered by her comments about Chandra's. Still, he tried to regain his initial enthusiasm. After all, it had been so long. It is so good to see you again. I wondered if we might meet when I returned here. I had hoped so. Why? Her question put him off balance. You are my sister. My only flesh and blood. We have not seen each other in millennia. And whose fault is that? She snapped without warning. Maev? Suddenly, Gerard faced a person whose expression was filled with anger, with bitterness. This was not the reunion for which he had hoped. Maev shook her head at his obvious naivete. Did you think I would forget even after all this time? You shamed us. You were one of the leaders of our people. I was quite proud of you then. My little brother, commander of the Night Elf host. I watched you grow during the war, taking over after the death of that aristocratic imbecile Star-Eye, and proving to everyone that the name Shadow Song should be respected by all. You do not understand. You never will, it seems. You apparently never understood duty and loyalty. She hesitated when she noticed something on his face. Only then did Gerard feel the moistness running down his left cheek and the stinging near his eye. He touched his hand to the moisture, then looked at his fingers. Blood. Gerard could not recall when it had happened, but assumed that it must have been during his encounter with the mysterious creature. Yet he did not remember the beast scratching him there. That got dangerously close to your eye, his sister commented with a surprising hint of softness in her tone. She put a finger to the stinging area. Did you fall or slip on the path? I remember you being better skilled on the hunt than that. It only occurred then to Gerard that he had not yet had a chance to tell her about the startling confrontation. Maev, there was something here in the forest with us. Something I have never seen before anywhere. I ran into it just before I caught up with you. It could still be nearby. Her mockery died away, and Maev, the warrior, took over. Did it do that to you? What did it look like? No. The scratch I must have gotten from a tree branch after I collided with the creature. It did not attack me. Gerard collected his thoughts. I did not get a good look. It happened so quickly. Something lupine. I think... All I saw were claws, teeth, and a shape not unlike our own, but wider. We do what we oh. Maev no longer looked interested. One of them. There is nothing to fear there. They do not dare get on the High Priestesses or Archdruid Malfurion's bad side. He could not believe that what he had seen could be so easily dismissed. Them. There are more like that. Father. Roaming around Arnassus's boundaries. Forget it, brother. It fled, did it not? That tells you all you need to know. They are cowardly skulkers with no bite. The worgen are undesirables who could not even save their own home. What are... But before Gerard could finish, Maev had begun to move on. She did not head directly toward Darnassus, but rather took a path that would make her skirt the east side of the capital. Gerard had to rush to keep up. Do as I say, and forget them, she repeated. Besides... It is certainly not your duty to police the capital. You gave up any sense of duty millennia ago. The barb hit true. Gerard grimaced, but sought to defend himself. Maev, I gave our people centuries of dedication to duty, of devotion to... Centuries of dedication! She laughed in his face. 
That is nothing. Gerard, I have remained true to my duties as a protector of the night elf race from the moment I became a priestess of Elune, and afterward as a watcher, until even now. I volunteered to oversee the imprisonment of Illidan Stormrage, even though that meant my fate was locked for millennia with his. I pursued him when other misfortunes enabled his escape. I survived torture as his prisoner, and finally had the chance to do what should have been done in the very beginning. Slay the Archdruid's accursed twin. Maiev. She waved off the hand he reached to her. Spare me any sympathy. I chose duty where you did not. Sometimes that has meant that I have made decisions that to others were not always evident as the right ones until much later. But I regret none of them. I understand. You have ever been determined to do what was best for all, regardless of how it made you look at times. I have always admired that steadfastness in you. The muscles in his sister's face grew a little less taut. A hint of weariness touched her gaze. I do what I must do. This time he would not brook her blocking his hand. He put a hand on her shoulder and wished that the armor would not prevent him from gently squeezing Maiev there. I have missed you. Of all those I left behind, I missed you the most. The general would not enjoy hearing that. Do not joke with me about that. Not now. She patted him on the arm. My mistake. You have had a terrible loss. I recall Chalasir. Well skilled in the martial arts training of the sisterhood. She would have made a good watcher. He grew uncomfortable. I need to return. I am sorry, Maiv. Later, yes. Later we will talk more. Be off with you. My condolences. Gerard hesitated, then turned. However, a nagging guilt at leaving matters so unfinished made him almost immediately look back. Maiev was gone. The former guard officer nearly called out, then hesitated. Brow furrowed, he eyed where his sister had stood, then resumed his journey back to Darnassus and his Shalasir. In another part of the forest near Darnassus, others had gathered. They were clad much more elegantly than other night elves and bore about them an inherent air of superiority. Their sleek robes were flamboyant and brilliantly colored. Although clearly night elves, these were the highborn, the highest caste of old night elf nobility. However, due to their continued use of arcane magic, they had been shunned by their brethren following the War of the Ancients. Once there had been many more of them, but some had fallen serving their arrogant and evil queen Azara, while others had been later transformed in other manners, turned into the reptilian, sea-dwelling fiends called Naga. Refugees from Eldrathalus, better known to most in this age by the more apt title Dire Maul, these night elf magi and their fellow survivors remained shunned by many of those in Darnassus. Though the highborn even now maintained an air of absolute independence, in truth they found themselves in need of others. However, that by no means meant any lacking in arrogance or in their desire to continue their study of the arcane, no matter what the cost. There were twenty at this gathering, twenty of the strongest. Varden Skyseeker was leader of the twenty and had aspirations to be much more. The eventual successor to the Highborn's speaker, Archmage Mordant Evenshade. Varden now guided the spell that the twenty cast, a test of their power. The swirling energies gathered within the circle the casters formed. The faces of each male and female in the group glowed from not only the radiance, but also his or her deep enthrallment. Varden gestured, and the energies came together in one powerful yet compact sphere. He gestured again, and tendrils reached out in the four directions of the compass. 
We are now ready, he told the others through the link that their spell work created. As one, the highborn drew a sign in the air. The tendrils grew stronger and more erupted from the sphere. The sphere itself pulsated rapidly. A horrific wind tore through the region. Highborn cried out in surprise as they were buffeted. The circle broke, but Varden kept the link solid. They had come this far with their efforts. He was not about to let them all fail. Then, what at first some mistook for thunder roiled through the area. Varden looked up, but there were no clouds. He stared at the treetops, which shook violently, more violently than the wind demanded. It was they, in fact, that were the source of the deafening roar. Keep to your efforts, Varden snapped at some of his companions, the clearly unnatural actions of the forest finally unnerving them enough to cause risk to the spell. He led the way, concentrating harder and trying to draw the others back into the effort. A tremendous wrenching drowned out the roar. One of the nearest trees bent down. Its limbs now acted like so many tentacles from some kraken. They reached for those highborn below them. More wrenching arose from beyond the boundaries of the gathering. Everywhere the closest trees stretched their branches toward the spellcasters. The link weakened beyond Varden's will to keep it intact. The gathered energies faded and the tendrils dissipated. The sphere shrank and then melted away with a pitiful hiss. As it vanished, many of the exhausted highborn slumped to the ground. Varden remained standing, although it was secretly an effort to do so. Gritting his teeth, he searched the forest for the cause of the disaster. I made matters very clear regarding the practice of your arcane arts, boomed a voice from every direction. This goes against everything upon which the Archmage and I agreed. One of the other spellcasters thrust a finger toward Varden's left. There the branches and underbrush gave way of their own accord to open a path to a lone figure wielding only a staff. Arch drew it. Varden did not bow to Malfurion Stormrage, though he did nod his head in respect. I have petitioned over and over about some mild changes in our agreement, but received no suitable answer. We need more leeway in our efforts. Our powers will stagnate if we cannot utilize them in a sufficient manner. Malfurion strode up to Varden, then raised the staff slightly. Varden wisely quieted. Your petition is still under consideration by both Mordant and me, as you have been informed more than once, and there has been no answer on it for reasons you have already been told. The reputation of the Highborn will always be stained by their past. As the Archmage's Theroshan, you should understand that. You Highborn chose to stay in Eldrathalus, defending and hiding in your special city as the war bloodily played out elsewhere. We fought for our home. You stood by while the Queen's counselor, Xavius, oversaw the creation of the portal that let the Legion into our world. You stood silent when Queen Azara chose the demons over her own people, and you continue your practice of arcane magic, even though it is the same magic that drew the Legion to us. Even the millennia have not stripped the people's memories of those final days. It was difficult enough even to gain your kind the right to come to Darnassus. We came here thanks to your promises, Archdruid. We came here with the assurance that we were to be a part of Night Elf society again, yet also with the understanding that we will maintain our own identity too. However, as you yourself so eagerly point out, we are still ostracized. We must be able to openly practice our arts. Otherwise, that alone proves your promises, and those of the High Priestesses amount to nothing. The Archdruid stepped closer, only pausing when he and Varden were within reach of one another. Malfurion's gold eyes gleamed sharply. 
some of the highborn's arrogance faltered. There is every intention of the highborn becoming a part of our society again, but such things cannot and will not happen overnight, Malfurion quietly but sternly replied. This is a process that will have to play out over time, perhaps years. Patience is a virtue we must all nurture, Varden. If we can, we will succeed. Mordant understands that. Varden did not look convinced, but nodded. Malfurion turned to the rest of the assembled highborn. Go back to the others and tell them what I said, and tell them that the High Priestess Tyranda and I keep our promises. The other spellcasters wasted no time in beginning their retreat. Even the Highborn greatly respected the power of the legendary Archdruid. Only Varden remained behind. I mean no disrespect, Archdruid. I am simply seeking the best for my own. Mordant and I are aware of what you seek. With that, Malfurion returned to the forest, not once looking back or speaking to Varden. The mage eyed the archdruid's receding form, not stirring until Malfurion was long gone. A scowl spread across Varden's handsome face. We will be patient. To a point, he muttered. Only to a point. Still scowling, the highborn followed after his companions. Caught up in his fury, he ignored his surroundings. To his kind, trees were just trees, the forest merely a gathering of trees. The undergrowth through which he pushed was only overgrown weeds that, if not for his hosts, he would have raised instantly in order to clear a proper path. The highborn lived for their arcane arts. They were used to having the environment bow to them, not the other way around, as it was with those who had built Darnassus. Like many highborn, Varden respected only power. The archdruid and the high priestess were powerful, thus Varden bowed to them. The rest of Darnassus, however... The mage's foot shoved against something that momentarily caused him to stumble. Well used to the disorganized manner of the forest, Varden kicked at the object without looking, then continued on through the underbrush. He had led his band out to this location due to its supposed remoteness, but otherwise had only contempt for it. He looked forward to returning to the relatively civilized settlement the highborn had set up. And so the hand that Varden had kicked, the hand of the dead highborn who had been but recently one of his band, lay with its owner for the time undiscovered. Chapter 6 Storm at Sea the storm struck suddenly, battering the ten great ships mere days from port. It quickly became one of the worst storms the orc captain could ever recall. Thunder crashed and lightning continuously lit up the sky. The rain came down in torrents and the sea rocked. Brilne roared orders to the crew, trying to keep the flagship under control. If it looked as if he could not maintain command during the storm, then the entire fleet risked slipping into chaos as other captains turned to their own initiative. With the cargo they were carrying, such a choice would spell even greater disaster. The ship leapt into the air as another huge wave rolled by. Brilne gripped the rail as the vessel came down hard. Those who had never sailed the seas could not appreciate just how much like stone water could feel at such times. The entire ship shook, and the hull creaked ominously. A scream from above made the fleet captain force his gaze into the downpour. He looked just in time to see one of the mariners who had been working on some of the snarled rigging fall into the sea. Brilne grunted but did not call for a rescue. In this storm, the hapless mariner was already dead. 
The York officer was more interested in getting the rest of his crew and his ship, all the ships, to safety. Brilne had sworn an oath to the war chief that he was capable of fulfilling this mission. A shout from one of the crew made the captain turn. The other orc pointed frantically toward one of the trailing vessels. Brilne wiped the rain from his good eye and squinted. There was a glow rising from the ship in question. Fire. Such a blaze could have started by lightning, yet this fire already appeared too spread out and was confined to the deck for the most part. Generally, lightning caught the sails, rigging, or masts. Thunder rumbled. Brilne caught up in the distant spectacle all but ignored it, until it ended not by fading, but rather by being accented by a ferocious and much too near roar. He spun around and ran to the opposing rail. There, crashing through another humongous wave, the second ship in the fleet rocked wildly about in a manner that was contrary to the currents and wind. Something was shaking the ship from within its very hold. The captain took up a spyglass that he always carried on him when aboard. Holding the copper tube, he focused it on the sister vessel, where oil lamps secured to the masts and other strategic areas gave enough illumination to reveal what was happening. The captain of the second ship, a gruff mariner personally promoted by Brilne, had his crew arming themselves with sea lances. Near the aft, three other orcs were lighting torches using oiled rags. Hardy warriors, they nonetheless looked very, very anxious. Brilne swore. He waved the spyglass in an attempt to get the attention of one of those aboard the other ship. No one noticed. The fire spreading over the more distant ship now made more sense. That crew had been trying to do the same as these mariners and had somehow lost control of the situation. Thinking of the previous vessel, Brilne turned the spyglass toward it. To his shock, it was no longer in sight. Such a blaze should have still been evident, unless the ship had already sunk. Cursing, Brilne looked to his first mate. A signal lamp! Hurry! But as he gave the order, the flagship shook as if it had struck a hard reef. Brilne fell to the side. The first mate dropped to his knees. Another mariner dropped over the rail and into the voracious sea. Another thump rattled the deck. Brilne struggled to rise. The storm's woken all of them up. Forget the lamp. Have the sleep powder readied and spread it both on some food and the points of four spears. I want that thing below quieted, or we'll be in as bad a shape as those other vessels. As the first mate and the others followed his orders, Brilne returned his attention to the sister ship. Matters there were only worse. Why haven't they quieted the beast, he wondered. A quick scan of the deck revealed the answer. Blackened wreckage marked the area where the barrel with the herb powder used to keep the beast sedated had been kept secure. Rain by itself could not have touched the tarp-covered container tucked under the overhang of the door to the captain's cabin, but lightning could have, and had. The entire area had been blasted, and with it the only certain way to keep their savage cargo docile. The flagship's own thumping slowed. A desperate notion occurred to Brilne. He raced over to the hold entrance just as the first mate emerged. The other orc looked exhausted, but triumphant. He was just waking. We caught him in time. The captain cut him off. Who's the best shot? The first mate grinned. That'd be me, Captain. You know that. We've got a good amount of the powder left. Can you shoot a couple of sacks over to her? Brillen gestured at the other ship. They've lost all their supply. Aye. Another roar echoed from the direction of the other ship. Brillen brought up the spyglass. The orcs with the torches were racing toward the hold. There several mariners with lances prepared to descend. The deck behind them erupted. A gasp escaped Brilm. He had seen no lightning. What could have... As the shattered planks settled, the answer revealed itself. 
The silhouette of a huge hand briefly rose above the ruined deck, then sank back down. As that happened, the ship rocked back and forth even more violently. Some of the crew hurried to the hole. As that happened, Brilne's second returned. Two pouches, the other orc shouted over the storm. Where? Somewhere on the deck where they'll see them. Just hurry. Aye. The first mate bound one tiny sack to an arrow, then readied the ladder for firing. Even in such a storm, a skilled orc archer could be certain of hitting his target more often than not. But before Brilne's second could let loose, the other ship rocked even more wildly. Several of the crew, focused on the hole in the deck, suddenly went stumbling toward the rails. Two fell over, and one only saved himself by grabbing hold at the last moment. The first mate shifted, trying to compensate. With the other orcs being flung this way and that, there was now more of a risk of shooting one of them. The second ship tilted again, nearly falling sideways due to the additional impetus of another wave. As the vessel righted, the archer finally fired. Brilne let out a lusty roar. The arrow landed true about a yard from the gaping hole. One of the crew noticed it and ran to retrieve the pouch. It was clear that he had a fairly good idea what the flagship had just sent over. Quick! The other! the captain commanded. One pouch likely had more than enough powder to quiet the beast, but a second would guarantee success. The first mate raised his bow. The side of the hull facing the flagship shattered. A fearsome hoofed leg shot out, then pulled back in. The rough sea turned the damaged ship, bringing the new gap to the water. The sea flooded into the fractured hold. Forget the powder, Brown roared. What can I do for you? He needed to say no more. Oh, well. Abandoning the effort, the first mate rushed to give the order to heave toward the floundering vessel. A wave briefly righted the ship, but its cargo, obviously growing more enraged, lashed out once more. Planks splintered as the hoof kicked again. The hull nearly doubled in size. When the ship listed this time, there was no doubt of its imminent fate. With water rushing in, the horde vessel quickly sank. Within moments, the deck was at sea level. Orcs leapt for the churning water, trying to reach the flagship. Several were immediately swept under by the waves and did not resurface. Wild roars escaped the hold. The gargantuan hands ripped away at what remained of the deck. Yet for all the creature's brute strength, he could not climb free in time. The deck sank below the water. The sea shoved the ship farther from the rest of the fleet. One by one, the lanterns were doused, leaving only a silhouette of the ill-fated vessel. A final frustrated roar cut over the storm. The silhouette changed as something seemed to erupt from the sinking ship's deck. Brilne grasped hold of the rail, the rescue attempt for the moment erased from his thoughts as the fear of a new threat to his own ship occurred to him. He envisioned the titanic creature wending his way closer. But with one last huge bubble of escaping air, the floundering ship went completely under. The last plunge happened so swiftly that the beast had no opportunity to react. The flagship drew near two of the survivors. Brilne doubted more than a handful would make it, if even that many. He mourned their brave deaths, then considered what the night's events might mean. He had lost a fifth of his precious cargo. Eight should do, the captain muttered. Eight should surely do. But that was up to the war chief. That was up to Garrosh. Brilne hoped for no more losses. Surely if there were no more losses, then Garrosh would forgive him for this failure. But if the war chief did find fault with him, Brilne asked only that the great orc leader let him see the crushing of the alliance in Ashenvale. That would make the captain's own death worth it all. There is a change in us, Malfurion noted as he strode through Darnassus, and not one for the better. 
The archdruid knew exactly when this undesired shift in the mood of the night elves had happened, and what had caused it. Shalasir. They cannot forget Shalasir. Night elves were used to death in battle or by accident. What they were not used to was the loss of a life due to infirmity tied to aging. Tyranda had spoken with Gerard, and through him learned the extent of Shalasir's troubles. The illness had not been the only trouble, only the final straw. Gerard and his mate had been suffering from a number of minor but increasingly consistent aches and pains that sounded all too familiar to Malfurion, whose shoulder suffered twinges even now. He eyed those nearest his path as he crossed the gardens. A dour atmosphere pervaded them. Malfurion could imagine their thoughts. Each wondered not only if this was the fate awaiting them, but also just how imminent it might be. And he was no better than they were. There was no escaping the inevitable, but through the use of the Sisterhood, Tyrande was already trying to stem the rising fear. She also looked to the examples of the younger races, the humans especially, for how to handle the aging and sickness. True, the humans too suffered great emotional distress from both, but they also had a resilience that in most cases salvaged them. At the moment, neither the Archdruid nor his mate was certain that their own race as a whole would prove as equal to the tests. Malfurion forced the situation from his thoughts. He had to concentrate on the summit. Preparations had at last been finalized, and the arrivals of the representatives were close at hand. Malfurion now had to concern himself with the specifics of what he hoped would be accomplished. Archdruid Malfurion Stormrage. It was next to impossible to come upon the Archdruid without his noticing, but the speaker had done just that. Fortunately, Malfurion was not one of tender nerve. He simply turned and, to no surprise, found himself gazing down slightly at a human. The man was in the prime of life, strong of jaw and with narrow eyes. He was clad in loose, simple brown garments. Despite being unarmed, he bore a stance that marked him as a fighter. Malfurion knew him. Edric. Edric bowed low, his long brown-black hair falling forward. My lord Gen Greymane hoped to have a word with you, if you've time this day. The archdruid's brow furrowed. As a matter of fact, Edric, I should speak with him right now. Where is he? The human straightened. I left him near the warrior's terrace by the path leading to our refuge. Edric grimaced. To be frank, Archdruid, I think he hoped you might do as you suggest. He knows time is short. Then lead me. As Idric obeyed, Malfurion saw how the presence of this one human distracted the night elves in the vicinity, almost as much as their concern over their aging did. Despite the fact that humans and other members of the Alliance had had access to Darnassus since its founding, it was clear that Edric was recognized as one of Gen's aides, and thus, also recognized for what else he was. For his part, the young human kept his gaze straight ahead, almost as if nothing else existed but the path. Malfurion knew that the truth was just the opposite. Edric was as uncomfortable as the citizens of Darnassus, if not more so. Edric moved as silently as any night elf. No mean feat for a human. He said nothing as they exited the city, but Malfurion noted that he finally relaxed as they entered the forest. The archdruid found it fascinating that a human would be more relieved to be in the wilderness than in a city. As ever, the trees welcomed the night elf's presence. Branches gently swayed against the wind, and leaves rattled. To Edric it was not noticeable. To Malfurion... It was a pleasure. He made a gesture that he knew the trees would sense, acknowledging their greetings. Then the welcome gave way to something else. In the language of the trees, Malfurion heard, He waits. 
He waits behind three knob growth. All trees had names. Most were incomprehensible to even the arch druid. What the night elf heard was an approximate definition of what those names meant. Tree names were almost always physical descriptions of their characteristics, and no two trees, to his knowledge, had the same one. Malfurion knew three knob growth one of the first to rise in this part of the forest, so the tree had proudly informed him upon their first encounter some weeks earlier. He turned toward it, just as Gen Greymane stepped out. Hail, King of Gilneas, the Archdruid solemnly declared. Gilneas, murmured the brawny dower figure. Gen Greymane resembled a bear, albeit an aging one. No handsome man, he yet had a commanding presence and eyes still sharp and quick for a human of his more mature age. Unlike the night elf, Gen sported a much shorter clipped beard. He stood taller than Edric, which brought him slightly nearer to the night elf in stature. Gilneus, the king repeated, in name only, Archdruid. For now, Edric piped up, we shall see. Glancing at the other human, Gen added, And why is the Archdruid here? I asked you to see about an audience with him, not drag him to me. Malfurion interjected before the misunderstanding could grow out of proportion. I told your man to take me to you, Gen. Your request coincided with my need to talk with you. Following Edric back saved valuable time. It's about the summit, Archdruid. Of course. Gilneas is one of the most prominent reasons I sought to bring it to fruition. Your people's admission to the Alliance is... Re-admission, you mean? The king growled with much bitterness. After I was foolish enough to think that Gilneas was best served taking matters into its own hands. Gen... The curse was something beyond your control. You could not have... It doesn't matter, the Lord of Gilneas growled, for the moment sounding more like an animal than a man. He leaned into the arched druid, and although Malfurion was still taller, to the night elf it seemed that their gazes met evenly. Gen seemed bigger, wilder. It doesn't matter. We are and will always be cursed. Malfurion fought to take command of the conversation again. We wanted to speak to one another about the gathering. The first emissaries will be arriving tomorrow. Gen deflated. Yes. The summit. They'll all have their chance to judge me for my foolish mistakes. I have been in contact with several of them. They understand the necessities of the time. They understand that you regret all that happened. They also can appreciate what you and your people can offer. And do they understand it's a double-edged sword they are offered, Archdruid? The Night Elf extended a comforting hand to the human's shoulder. Gen accepted it without question. You have gained far better control of it than you think. You offer nothing but advantage, Gen. At the very least, they will have to seriously consider that aspect. Even storm wind. I have no answer there, Malfurion admitted. But I have great hope. The Archdruid leaned closer. He is coming. That was what I especially wanted to tell you. Storm wind is coming? blurted Edric. My lord, that means... Exactly nothing, the king of Gilneas responded at first. Still his eyes shone with hope of his own. No, perhaps it means much, if he and I can set aside our differences. I know that I'm more than willing. Varian Rin is a wise man, the archdruid pointed out. Stormwind would not be what it is if he were not. Gen finally could not help smiling at the news. As you say. 
This lightens my heart. There is a chance after all. If he's coming, he must be willing to let bygones be bygones. Malfurion pulled back. I need to return to dealing with the summit. I merely wanted to assure you that there is every reason to believe that Gilneas will be accepted into the Alliance. I want your promise that you will attend as previously stated, and be willing to show your humility as well as your strength. I'll be doing my part. Don't you doubt it, Archdruid. Gen offered his hand, which Malfurion shook. There's my promise again on all we agreed to. If there's any hope of seeing our home again, it's to get through this summit. And I promise again to see that everyone understands the import of this. Even Stormwind. Gen Greymane signaled to Edric, who slipped into the forest. The Lord of Gilneas gave Malfurion one last grateful nod. I know you'll do all you can. It wouldn't have gotten this far without you, Archdruid. Gen gritted his teeth. But from here on, you know it all lies in one man's hands. He will come to see things as they must be for all our sakes. I believe that. But let us pray to your Elune just the same. I'll take all the help we can get. With that, the king slipped into the forest. The archdruid stood there, momentarily caught up in his thoughts, his gaze fixed on the area into which Gen and Edric had departed. A large, dark shape momentarily arose among the underbrush, then disappeared among the trees again. It was tall enough to be a man, but was not. The sight, though expected, still jarred the night elf slightly. As he turned, he again silently swore to do everything he could to help the refugees from Gilneas, including ensure that they were welcomed back into the Alliance by everyone. After all, they might never even have been cursed, if not for Malfurion. <laughs>